So better, better be serious about it. Okay. So I hope we can start. The ones who could not be over here due to the test, uh, sorry, due to the class that is still going on. We are starting the recording for them. And that would be uploaded on AFMG app. Please remember it would be only on the app. So those who have access to the app would only receive the, otherwise uh, you wouldn't receive. So with this, I hope, can we begin? Please let me know if I'm audible to all of you. So we will try to cover ENT. I hope all of you are quite aware that ENT is a very important subject from part two. And uh, like in paper two, usually there are most important subjects and the main two important ones are ENT and Octal, according to my knowledge, because please remember these subjects are the ones which have shortest notes, but they are the most high yielding ones. So it's better that you have these subjects on your fingertips and uh, like ENT, if it is on your fingertips, that would be definitely helpful to each and every one of you. Right. So with this, we will try to cover ENT mostly in a two hour session. Okay. Please be patient. I know it's hard for you, all of you who have been there in the sessions, maybe the online session or the offline session. So, but I would still hope that all of you would help me out. Just a So with this, I begin the session for today. So I hope all of you are quite aware of the fact that this is the exam for your existence. So now this is the, uh, this is for the reason that I know you have been there for a whole day session. And so you need some motivation before starting the session, right? So please remember if you are not stretching yourself right now at this point of time, definitely you are lagging somewhere. So please remember this is important that this is the exam for your existence because if you are not able to clear this exam, okay? So please remember that you are not able to clear this exam, then please remember you actually does not exist. I'm not talking about in literal terms, but professionally you would not exist, right? So definitely you need to put your heart and soul into it. Stretch yourself for the two hour session now, okay? Because as we know that medicine demands time, we have been there for almost five or six hours, then over here preparing for a session uh, for our examination. And then almost it takes a seven to eight year long period that we are actually uh, licensed doctors in India, right? So our parents are really patient throughout this process and they only expect us to be successful, okay? Only to crack this exam. So for them, at least, I hope, uh, because they have been supportive to you throughout. So you will also be able to support them in future. And uh, like all of you would say that we are supportive to them. Please remember it is not about the physical presence or about the mental or emotional support that you are giving to them. But now, though they say, or, or say it or not, they are also expecting some amount of financial support also from you all guys. Okay. So please remember, I hope you all would be able to lend them that financial support. And with, for that only, you need to just pass this exam, right? With this, I begin the session for today, talking about the question number one that we have over here. Just a minute. Yeah. So talking about the question number one, which says a 25 year old man Let me change that. A 25 year old man got into a fight with his friends and presented to your OPD as shown in the image. Which of the following statement is false? So you need to actually figure out the false statement or the incorrect statement regarding the diagnosis. So first of all, let's come to a diagnosis. What is our provisional diagnosis in this condition? Please comment in the chat box. So the provisional diagnosis in this condition guys, is actually pinna 
hematoma, right? The diagnosis in this condition is pinna hematoma. As you can see over here, the swelling which can be appreciated on the pinna on the posterior aspect on the posterior superior aspect of the pinna. Here you can see there is accumulation of blood, and when this accumulation of blood occurs between the yellow elastic cartilage of pinna and between its perichondrium, that is actually called as a pinna hematoma. And the most common cause of pinna hematoma, as it is pretty much evident from our question also, it is trauma. So please remember the most common cause of pinna hematoma would be trauma, right? So now let's start to rule out the options one by one. Option A says, cause is extravasation of blood. Yes, due to extravasation of blood between the yellow elastic cartilage and the perichondrium, there would be this pinna hematoma. Option B says treatment is incision and drainage. So usually, please remember the first line treatment that we do for pinna hematoma is actually aspiration with a syringe. Okay, so we aspirate the hematoma. But if in case the aspiration is not successful in those conditions, the next line of management or treatment would be incision and drainage. Please remember, whenever we perform this aspir aspiration, we need to actually apply a pressure brand pressure bandage because reaccumulation is very much common. So recurrence is very, very common in cases of pinna hematoma. So uh, along with aspiration, we also apply a pressure bandage thoroughly. If pressure bandage is not applied properly, then there are chances of recurrence or reaccumulation at the site. Okay. Whereas second line management would be incision and drainage. Option C says rewarming with moist cotton pledgets. Please remember rewarming with moist cotton pledgets is usually done in cases of frostbite injuries and not in cases of pinna hematoma. Okay, when the patient is exposure uh, exposed to freezing temperatures like the Siachen Glacier, over there, when there would be necrosis or ischemia to the pinna cartilage, in that case is usually we will uh, do the rewarming. Okay, not in this condition. Option D says there is high chance of reaccumulation. As I told you, if the pressure bandage is not applied properly, there are high chances of reaccumulation or reoccurrence in this case. So the exception of the false statement in this condition is option C. Rewarming with moist cotton pleasure is not required in cases of pinna hematoma. Right. Moving further, talking about our next question that says a 68 year old. That means an elderly patient who is a diabetic male presents with persistent ear discharge with fever and headache. He complained pain out of proportion. On examination, granulations and tenderness are observed on the floor of the external auditory canal, that is your EAC. Along with that, there is also facial nerve palsy. He is not responding to antibiotics. What is the most probable diagnosis? So what is the provisional diagnosis in this condition? I hope from the first two words, you are very sure that if it if they are talking about an elderly patient who is a known diabetic, they might be talking about a condition known as malignant otitis externa or automycosis. Okay, so please remember an elderly patient who is a known diabetic or immunocompromised patient like HIV positive patients, they are more prone or more at the risk of developing these two conditions, right? Now the symptoms would be persistent ear discharge, fever, headache. These are the symptoms of ear infection usually, right? And both of these are ear infection. Malignant otitis externa is a bacterial ear infection of the external ear, whereas automycosis is actually a fungal infection of the external ear, right? So both of these are ear infection. They are also saying that the patient complains of pain out of proportion, right? Please remember, they have said that the pain is out of proportion. That even is not relieved at times on giving analgesic. Okay, that can also be mentioned sometimes in the question. Along with that, they have mentioned on examination of the EAC, on the floor of EAC, the examiner can find granulations, right? Please remember, if I talk about automycosis, guys, automycosis is actually a fungal infection caused by which fungus, anybody? It is the fungal infection of your external ear. It is caused by which fungus, anybody? Let me join from the mobile also so I can see your comments properly. Just give me a second so I could join from the other devices. Okay. okay, so I hope all of you are commenting. Right. So here, if I talk about automycosis, it is fungal infection of the external ear and it is caused by a fungus known as Aspergillus niger. Okay. So please remember, it can also be due to Aspergillus fumigatus. 
it can also be due to candida albicans but the most common fungus responsible is actually aspergillus niger and niger means black so please remember there would be a white and black appearance in the external auditory canal if there is a or the fungal infection known as automycosis and this has a characteristic name known as the wet newspaper appearance or a wet blotting paper appearance nothing such has been mentioned over here a blackish or a whitish mass which is uh, like which is similar to a wet newspaper or a wet blotting paper something like that has not been mentioned in this question right important so they rather they have mentioned about granulation so please remember whenever there would be granulations in this condition it is more likely to be option c that is malignant otitis externa Automycosis may the main symptom or the most common symptom is usually itching. Okay, so please remember the patient will complain of itching out of proportion. Whereas in cases of malignant otitis externa, the patient will complain of pain out of proportion with presence of granulations in the EAC. Right, and there is a high risk of involvement of the seventh cranial nerve. So if they ask you which is the most common cranial nerve involved, the answer should be the facial nerve or the seventh cranial nerve is the most commonly involved. Apart from that. that can also lead to involvement of the 9th the 10th and the 11th and 12th cranial nerve okay so please remember this can also lead to involvement of 9th 10th 11th and 12th cranial nerve okay because this infection can also extend up to the skull base okay this can lead to skull base osteomyelitis okay so please remember it is a life threatening infection which can spread to the skull base as well okay so this is important elderly diabetic patient दो चीजें हो सकती है सो आउट ऑफ दैट यू नो अ बैक्टीरियल इन्फेक्शन नोन एज मैलिग्नेंट और डायटस एक्सटर्नल एंड द मोस्ट कॉमन बैक्टीरिया रिस्पांसिबल फॉर दिस वुड बी so the most common bacteria responsible for malignant otitis externa please remember this was a question it is usually pseudomonas aeruginosa okay pseudomonas aeruginosa is the most common bacteria responsible for causing malignant otitis externa okay and the treatment should be if it is a bacterial infection definitely the treatment would be iv antibiotics right so in this condition usually iv antibiotics are given to the patient okay so please remember the first picture of an otoscopy that you can see over here it gives us a white and blackish appearance so this is actually the wet newspaper or a wet blotting paper appearance which is usually a feature of which condition so it is the feature of auto mycosis most common fungus responsible is aspergillus niger whereas if i talk about this condition where you can see there is bleeding or there is granulations in the external auditory canal along with the pus discharge this is suggestive of malignant otitis externa and the most common organism as we said it was pseudomonas aeruginosa okay and the treatment of choice would be third generation cephalosporins okay like ceftazidim can be given some books still say it as ciprofloxacin so all these drugs are given usually intravenously and then after the treatment we usually start them on oral therapy whereas the other condition that you can see over here it is again a boil which can be seen okay so please remember it is a boil also known as a furuncle so what is a furuncle or a boil so please remember infection of hair follicle is actually known as a furuncle or boil so it is important from derma as well as surgery point of view infection of a hair follicle is known as boil or furuncle okay and the most common cause for furunculosis is usually it is staph aureus so staphylococcus aureus is the most common cause for furunculosis okay whereas if i talk about the next condition over here blackish nasal mass blackish mass or blackish dots brownish dots on the palate blackish dots in the nose so all of this is suggestive of very good it is suggestive of mucor mycosis it is suggestive of mucor mycosis please remember okay and it is caused by a mucor fungus from the rhizopus family right it there would be a blackish mass and this blackish mass can also extend up to the orbit to the nose or even to the skull at times okay so this condition is actually termed as rhino cerebral mucor mycosis okay rhino cerebral because it can extend up to the nose as well as to the orbit and even to the skull at times again we know mucor mycosis is usually seen in immunocompromised patients or the patient having comorbidities and it was a sequel or complication of covid 19 infection during the recovery yes very good it is also common in diabetic patients yes very good it is also known as a black fungus great so please remember they are uh, yeah so please remember if they have mentioned there is no response to antibiotics what happens usually if you start the patient on antibiotics like azithromycin or others the patient would not respond in the initial stages okay the patient needs to be admitted and to be started on uh i be third generation anti uh, cephalosporins like ceftazidim or cefazosporin okay please remember then the patient would usually respond question number 3 says 
a 27 year old male that means a young adult male who was involved in a fist fight after excessive drinking was brought to the casualty so it might be a saturday night apart from a one by two centimeter laceration on his right cheek the below finding is seen this is treated with i hope this was the simplest question but it has also been asked in aina ct as well as the neat pg examination so yeah very good the provisional diagnosis in this condition as you can see there are swellings reddish colored swellings in both the nasal cavities so the diagnosis in this condition is actually a septal hematoma because there is a history of trauma and as we know for septal hematoma the most common cause is actually trauma so whenever there is trauma the patient on the nose the patient can have accumulation of blood within uh, the perichondrium and the bone beneath okay and therefore that can lead to a septal hematoma and i hope all of you are quite aware that in septal hematoma usually the treatment of choice in this condition should be option a incision and drainage right along with that definitely antibiotics are given okay and antibiotics are given for a reason to prevent any secondary bacterial infection okay please remember otherwise antibiotics does not have a primary role the primary role is always incision and drainage followed by that usually we do a nasal packing in this condition okay so nasal packing would also be done to prevent any recurrence or to prevent reaccumulation and then antibiotic cover would also be provided to the patient okay so please remember this i hope this was quite easy nothing to be discussed more uh, i still request you to abstain from these things question number 4 a 45 year old man from north india presents with a deformity as shown in the image below so this is the deformity as you can see on his nose he gives history of a foul smelling purulent nasal discharge purulent means pus containing nasal discharge before this nodule appeared the histopathological examination is given below the biopsy picture which of the following organisms is responsible for his condition so what is the provisional diagnosis very good i hope all of you are quite aware of this now so they have given a young adult male patient from north india so this condition is usually prevalent in the state of north india that is uh, i still ask you to abstain from doing this aj i feel so right so at least other people want to study so let them study please so the patient belongs to the northern states of india that is the states of uttar pradesh or sometimes rajasthan also and the patient can present with this deformity what is this deformity here you can see multiple nodules on the nose as well as there's a very hard nose known as woody nose okay so there's fibrosis extensive fibrosis which leads to this condition known as woody nose right so please remember the provisional diagnosis in this condition is actually rhinoscleroma also known as woody nose at times so please remember rhinoscleroma usually has three stages the first stage is actually resembling to atrophic rhinitis where he has mentioned that there was a history of foul smelling purulent nasal discharge so uh, we know that in cases of atrophic rhinitis or azina there is a history of foul smelling purulent nasal discharge with nasal crust formation right so the similar thing would also be seen in stage 1 of rhinoscleroma stage 2 is when the deformity of nodules will appear on the nose so that means it is woody nose hebra nose sometimes also referred to as staphyr nose right and the third stage would be fibrosis stage when there would be fibrosis extensive fibrosis of the external nose right so the condition in this can, uh, in this case is usually rhinoscleroma if i talk about the biopsy of the nodule or the histopathological examination if i can enlarge here you can see there are vacuolated cells okay these cells are vacuolated empty cells and these have a characteristic name known as mucilage cells right these have a characteristic name known as the mucilage cells okay if i can change the color something which yeah so these have a characteristic name known as the mucilage cells right whereas the other ones this blue colored inclusion bodies that you can see within the cells these also have a characteristic name known as russell bodies right so two important features on a biopsy of rhinoscleroma that you need to remember first the empty cells known as mucilage cells whereas the blue colored intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies known as russell bodies right so presence of russell bodies and mucilage cells even further confirms our diagnosis of rhinoscleroma in this condition as we know the common cause or the most common cause of rhinoscleroma is option b by the name it is evident it is klebsiella rhinoscleromatis right whereas klebsiella azinae is the causative agent behind atrophic rhinitis also known as azina 
right? Whereas rhinosporidium severa is the causative agent for rhinosporidiosis. If I can talk about these important nasal conditions, yeah, please, it's a request from everybody, okay? So, if I can, I would, but I'm not able to, sorry, from my device, I'm not able to remove that mark. So whoever has done this, I ask you to abstain from doing this and let other people study, please. If you are really good at ENT, I would request you to let other people study, please. This is a humble request from my side. If I talk about this condition of nose, where you can see there is hypertrophy of the sebaceous glands of external skin of the nose. So please remember skin of the external nose. Here there is hypertrophy of the sebaceous glands. This condition is known as, this condition is known as, very good. This condition is known as rhinophyma, also termed as potato nose. So rhinophyma or potato nose is due to hypertrophy of the sebaceous glands of the skin of the external nose, right? Om Puri, you need to remember. The other condition you can see over here, here, the un, young adult male is affected usually, and they will mention the person belongs to Southern part of India, more likely to the state of Tamil Nadu. And there's a history of usually taking a bath in dirty pond, which is also used by the animals. Okay, so these are the two key features in the question. Okay. Yeah. So please remember the first thing that you can see over here, there is a mass which can be seen in the nasal cavity. Okay. And this is actually a mulberry like nasal mass. So this mulberry like nasal mass is usually seen in a condition known as rhinosporidiosis. Okay. It is seen in condition known as rhinosporidiosis. And that was caused by an aquatic protozoa known as rhinosporidium sebera. Right. It is caused by an aquatic protozoa known as rhinosporidium sebera. So that you need to remember. Okay, please remember. Very good, very good. Can anybody tell me mulberry like nasal mucosa is a feature of mulberry like nasal mucosa? Please type in the chat box. In the meanwhile, I'll talk about this condition known as nasal masses. It is due to presence of the maggots in the nasal cavity. Okay, what are maggots? So please remember, maggots are nothing but larvae of the cryosomia house fly. Okay, so presence of these larvae or maggots in the nasal cavity leads to formation of a condition known as nasal myasis. Okay, it is not a polyp. There would be multiple maggots. Okay, and the treatment of choice in this condition, nasal myasis is known as, please remember here we'll actually instill a maggot oil and that maggot oil contains chloroform plus terpentine oil. Okay, it contains chloroform plus terpentine oil. So wherever there is presence of maggots, it is usually seen in cases of diabetic foot also. Okay, when there is infection, there would be presence of these larvae or maggots. At that time also, we will apply this serpentine oil all over the wood. Okay, and the maggots will just clear off the wood almost in a, uh, yeah, yeah, there would be 10% chloroform along with turpentine oil, which is used in this condition. Okay, the other one you can see a stone which is formed that is known as rhinolith. And here you can see a deformity of nose in this lady that is known as the saddle nose. Okay, that is known as the saddle nose due to deformity of the septal or the quadrangular cartilage. It is usually associated with conditions like leprosy and syphilis. Okay, this has been asked earlier, so please remember. Mu uh, no, please remember it is not a mulberry-like nasal mucosa. Very good. You are right. Mulberry-like nasal mucosa is seen in cases of inferior turbinate hypertrophy, which is associated with deviated nasal septum. It is actually a mulberry-like nasal mass, which is seen. Okay, in this condition. Please remember this. Question number five, if I talk about a patient was brought to the ENT OPD with hearing loss and BERA, that is brainstem evoke response audiometry. So it is an audiometric test to check for hearing was done. The wave response marked in the following image is generated from. So this is the BERA, which we can see. And there are almost total seven waves which are generated in BERA. Okay. We try to record the waves from the brainstem directly. Okay, and there are total seven waves which can be recorded. So can anybody tell me the wave which has been marked? That is wave number five. It arises from or it is generated from which among the part of the auditory cortex or the auditory pathway? Very good. So please remember the answer to this question is option C, lateral lemniscus. Okay, so from the lateral lemniscus, the most important wave of BERA, that is the wave number five, it arises. Okay, if... I ask you to remember the auditory pathway. It can be remembered by a mnemonic known as E. coli mark. It is a well-accepted mnemonic. 
So where E goes for your eighth nerve. Eighth cranial nerve is also known as your vestibulo cochlear nerve. Please remember. Okay. Then the signal would be sent to the cochlear nucleus. And this cochlear nucleus is located in the brain stem. Please remember. O goes for the olivary complex. And it is the superior olivary complex. So please remember it is the superior olivary complex and not the inferior one. L goes for lateral lemniscus. And it is the reason for the fifth wave, which is the most important wave considered in cases of Bera. I goes for the inferior colliculus. Okay, I goes for inferior colliculus. M goes for the medial geniculate body. So please remember, lateral geniculate body is a part of the optic pathway, whereas medial geniculate body is a part of the auditory pathway. Whereas lastly, A goes for the auditory cortex. And this auditory cortex is present in which lobe of the brain? So please remember, it is located in the temporal lobe of the brain. It is Broadman's area number 41. Okay, that you need to remember. Okay, I hope everything is visible properly. And the investigation that I have given down over here. Okay, uh, so let me stop it once and then again I start. Okay. Well, I hope now it would be fine. Once I stop it. Yeah, I'll share it once again. Sorry for the disturbance that has been there. Let me know once uh, the screen is visible again to all of you. So I hope now the screen would be visible. Yeah. So the investigation that I have shown over here, it is actually a pure tone audiometry, also known as an audiogram. Okay. So please remember, you need to differentiate between a Bera and a PTA. So this is a pure tone audiometry or audiogram, which is the initial investigation that we run for hearing loss usually. Here you can see two lines. So please remember the red line represents the right ear, whereas the blue line represents the left ear. And both these lines should be about 10, 25 decibels. That is below 25 decibels, sorry. So please remember both of these lines should be below 25 decibels because the normal hearing range, the normal hearing range on a pure tone audiometry is between minus 10 to 25 decibels. Normal hearing range is between minus 10 to 25 decibels. Okay. So the two lines should be between minus 10 to 25 decibels. Okay. Please remember right the red color represents right here, whereas the blue color represents the left ear. Okay. So with this, I move further. Question number five. It says a patient sustained a road traffic accident. That means a history of trauma and has a La Forte fracture type two. I hope all of you are quite aware. These La Forte fractures are facial fractures. These are of three different types, type one, type two, and type three. I'll explain it to you. With continuous nasal watery discharge, handkerchief test has been given below. All the statements about this condition are true except. So what is the provisional diagnosis in this condition? So before that, let me explain to you what are La Forte fractures. So please remember La Forte are usually fractures of the facial bones. If the fracture line traverses via the maxilla, okay, if the fracture line passes via the maxilla, then it is actually known as type 1 La Forte fracture. If the fracture line is usually pyramidal, okay, if the fracture is pyramidal, when it passes via the bridge of the nose, it is known as type 2 La Forte fracture. Okay, whereas type 3 is when the fracture line traverses via the orbits okay and this can lead to a craniofacial disjunction this can cause a craniofacial disjunction and in which two conditions there would be a higher risk of csf rhinorrhea or csf leak so please remember in type 2 and type 3 there is a higher risk of csf leak in this condition right so please remember in both these conditions usually the uh, cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone is at a higher risk of fracture or injury and once the cribriform plate is fractured, then there would be CSF leakage from the nasal cavity. And this condition is actually known as 
csf rhinorrhea right when the csf runs via the nose that is known as csf rhinorrhea right so please remember in this condition the patient was having a la forte type 2 fracture therefore at a high risk of having csf rhinorrhea they have said he was having a continuous nasal watery discharge so if it would have if it would have been a sputum or mucus so please remember it would not be continuous first thing second thing even if it is continuous it is not watery it would be rather sticky in nature so if it is non sticky like water then it has to be csf okay please remember apart from that handkerchief test has been given below and here you can see as there was a history of trauma so there was blood plus csf which was leaking out of the nasal cavity right and both of these were mixed so there were concentric rings which were produced okay so red and pale concentric rings were produced on a handkerchief or sometimes on a blotting paper as well and this is actually known as the halo sign or the target sign so halo sign or target sign on handkerchief test or on the blotting paper test is usually suggestive of csf rhinorrhea or rather i would correct myself traumatic csf rhinorrhea because when only the blood would be present there would be presence of this halo sign in untraumatic cases there would not be any presence of this halo sign or the target sign so let's uh, as we have come to a provisional diagnosis which is csf rhinorrhea let's rule out one by one because we need to find all the statements are true except so we need to find a incorrect or a false statement option a says immediate endoscopic surgical closure of the leakage site is done okay so please tell me in cases of csf rhinorrhea what is the first line management usually the first line management in csf rhinorrhea is conservative and it is not surgical okay so usually we would you recommend bed rest for the patient to decrease the intracranial pressure as the intracranial pressure decreases within a period of almost 7 to 10 days then the condition passes by itself okay so we would prefer a conservative management and not a surgical management initially for at least 7 to 10 days along with that we will also give a antibiotic cover to the patient to prevent any risk of meningitis in this condition right so conservative treatment that is bed rest for 7 to 10 days to decrease icp and an antibiotic cover is usually given if the csf leak continues even after 7 to 10 days then definitely a endoscopic surgical closure of the leaky site would be done but it is not the immediate treatment modality which is done so this statement stands false let's see other conditions or other statements also option b says beta 2 transferrin is helpful in diagnosis so i hope all of you are quite aware it is the best test in the laboratory investigations beta 2 transferrin levels in csf if these beta 2 transferrin is detected then definitely we are sure that it is csf rhinorrhea we do not need any further in investigation or testing in this condition okay so this is the best test available if they ask you which is the best radiological investigation then definitely the answer should be a high resolution ct scan of the skull so hr ct skull is the preferred radiological investigation overall it is beta 2 transferrin cribriform plate is the most common site of leak as we already discussed due to the fracture or the injury to the cribriform plate of ethmoid bone usually csf is commonly leaking from the site or from the nasal cavities right so please remember the answer to this question is option a can anybody tell me like please remember one of the important cause of uh, csf rhinorrhea is also anterior cranial fossa fracture right so please remember anterior cranial fossa fracture history can also be given in the question okay and the most common site to fracture in anterior cranial fossa is again the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone here there would be two findings first of all the csf rhinorrhea as we have discussed and the second finding is a periorbital ecchymosis right hematoma in and around the orbits and that is actually known as with sign that is known as your raccoon's eyes or the panda's eyes right so that is also a feature of anterior cranial fossa fracture but whereas if i talk about middle cranial fossa fracture please remember in middle cranial fossa fracture usually the most common site of fracture is the petrous part of your temporal bone and there is high risk of there is a high risk of csf autorrhea this time that means the csf would leak from the ears this time okay so in middle cranial fossa fracture there is high risk of csf autorrhea and there would be bruising or hematoma or discoloration over the mastoid surface and this was the statement in december 2021 what is the answer to this condition bruising discoloration or hematoma over the mastoid surface is known as which sign very good it is battle sign right it is the battle sign that you need to remember so battle sign and csf autorrhea middle cranial fossa fracture whereas csf rhinorrhea and periorbital ecchymosis known as raccoon eye or panda eye anterior cranial fossa fracture so with this i hope i have covered the question 
क्वेश्चन नंबर सिक्स नाउ गाइस इट इज इजी अ फीमेल पेशेंट प्रेजेंट्स टू द ईएनटी ओपीडी विद कंप्लेंट्स ऑफ नेजल ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन नेजल डिस्चार्ज एंड लॉस ऑफ स्मेल सो लॉस ऑफ स्मेल इज कॉल्ड एज अनोसमिया राइट ऑन एग्जामिनेशन द नोज इज फिल्ड विद क्रस एंड फाउल स्मेलिंग डिस्चार्ज राइट सो व्हाट आर क्रस क्रस आर नथिंग बट ड्राइड म्यूकस सिक्रीशंस राइट and there is also foul smelling discharge she is found to have merciful anosmia that is the key word for our provisional diagnosis right the patient is herself having anosmia but her nasal like nasal secretions are really really foul smelling no one can bear that secretion or the bear that smell of the secretion right but the patient is having anosmia herself therefore it is termed as merciful anosmia it is usually a young patient 20 30 40 year old patient having complaints of nasal obstruction nasal discharge okay and merciful anosmia and the nasal cavity as you can see it is filled filled with usually nasal crust nasal crust is nothing but as we have told you it is dried mucus secretions okay and this excess of nasal secretions or nasal crust are due to the wide spacious roomy nasal cavities that the patient has please remember if we remove the nasal crust we can see the patient usually has a wide roomy and very spacious nasal cavities why are these formed because there is atrophy of the mucosa submucosa and the turbinates of the nose okay all of them undergoes atrophy and therefore the nasal cavities become wide and roomy and there is accumulation of secretions and they dry up and lead to formation of nasal crust so the diagnosis in this condition is very good it is atrophic rhinitis which is also known as azena as we discussed right azena it is caused by klebsiella ozenae and what is the treatment of choice in this condition i hope all of you are quite aware very good very good it is option a alkaline nasal douching it is the treatment of choice in this condition where uh, powders of sodium bicarbonate that is baking soda is given okay sodium bicarbonate rightly discussed sodium bi bi borate and sodium chloride all of these are mixed a solution is made and syringing is done usually every day in the morning syringing is done mostly twice a day this alkaline nasal douching should be done okay to clear off the nasal crust which are filled in the nasal cavities whereas if the patient does not respond to this therapy then on a the long term definitely we can move on to the surgical option and that is a young suppression previously it was young suppression where one nasal cavity was closed for almost 6 months and then the same thing was done with the other nasal cavity as well right whereas nowadays we have a modified young suppression where there is a partial permanent closure of both the nasal cavities okay we will close both the nasal cavities partially in this condition so that is actually a surgical option and it is only considered in uh, refractory cases and not in the initial stages okay please remember tetracycline and streptomycin if they ask you these are the drugs usually used in cases of rhinoscleroma okay please remember in rhinoscleroma sometimes some books also say it as rifampicin so please remember don't abstain if you do not have tetracycline streptomycin an option and rather they have given rifampicin rifampicin is also used in cases of rhinoscleroma okay and septoplasty is a procedure which is done for deviated nasal septum dns right so i hope all of this is fine with everybody question number 7 now it says a 17 year old male patient underwent tonsillectomy again a recall question please remember his post operative period was uneventful so there is no complication in the post op period he was discharged the next day on post op day 6 he has presented in the emergency department with the complaints of mild bleeding from oral cavity what is the best further management yeah very good so here we are talking actually about the post operative bleeding or the post op hemorrhage which is the most common complication usually after surgery right so post op bleeding is more common complication after a tonsillectomy surgery which is done by the dissection and snare method right please remember and it is done after 6 weeks so when the patient presents to you in acute tonsillitis you refrain from doing tonsillectomy okay when the infection subsides by giving antibiotics after a period of usually 6 weeks you do a interval tonsillectomy right so the patient was might be called for an interval tonsillectomy and after the tonsillectomy surgery post op period was fine but the patient has a mild bleeding okay so this post op bleeding can be of three types it can be a primary bleeding which usually occurs during the surgery right then the, we have a reactionary bleeding reactionary hemorrhage or reactionary bleeding usually occurs within 24 hours of surgery right and for reactionary hemorrhage the most common cause is actually slippage of ligature or slippage of a knot okay 
and the best treatment for this condition in reactionary hemorrhage the patient has excessive bleeding and in that condition usually we need to take the patient to the operation theater to the ot and we need to re explore the site so admission and immediate re exploration in the operation theater is usually the treatment of choice for reactionary hemorrhage whereas if i talk about secondary hemorrhage it usually occurs after 5 days of surgery and in this question they have mentioned the patient has presented with bleeding on the post op day 6 so it is more likely secondary hemorrhage and in secondary hemorrhage there is not excess bleeding rather there is only a mild bleeding which is seen and the most common cause of secondary bleeding is usually infection and here it would be the infection of your tonsillar fossa please remember this okay so what should be the treatment of choice therefore it should be option b admission and iv antibiotics so please remember whenever you need to start iv antibiotics to the patient you need to admit the patient first so admission and iv antibiotics are to be started to this patient reassurance could not be done please remember if there is bleeding definitely there can be something wrong in this patient right blood transfusion is required only in cases of excess bleeding it is usually done in cases of reactionary hemorrhage but it is again not the first line management first line management in reactionary also remains re exploration of the surgical site okay and then if required blood transfusion can be done but not wait and watch or observation at any time so i hope this was easy can anybody tell me which is the most common vessel to bleed in cases of tonsillectomy surgery this was a recall question most common vessel to bleed in cases of tonsillectomy surgery most common vessel to bleed in cases of tonsillectomy surgery please remember it is the para tonsillar vein okay para tonsillar vein no 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 very good it is para tonsillar plexus okay spino palatal artery it is the artery of epistaxis we have a question further we'll discuss there question number 8 says the patient was suffering from hearing loss so audiometry was performed as i told you pure tone audiometry is the first line investigation in cases of hearing loss so it was performed and the image is given below likely diagnosis is so i hope it was very easy so please give it a thought again here you can see both the lines that is your left ear as well as right ear are up, uh, below 25 decibels but then at a point they have a dip this is actually known as a acoustic dip and the point at which the dip is seen okay if i can enlarge it for you the point at which the dip is seen is actually 4000 or 4 kilohertz okay so please remember at 4000 hertz if the acoustic dip is seen it is more likely suggest you of very good it is suggest you of option c noise induced hearing loss right so this is known as a acoustic dip sometimes also referred to as the boiler's dip sometimes also refers to as the boiler's dip at 4000 hertz it is suggest you of noise induced hearing loss and as we know noise induced hearing loss is due to prolonged of chronic exposure to a loud sound or loud noise it is usually seen in occupational workers who are exposed to constant chronic uh, noisy environment okay and what is the recommended level of noise this was asked from psm also it is important the recommended level of or the permissible level of sound or noise for occupational workers it is please remember it is 85 decibels okay please remember it is 85 decibels for 8 hours a day for almost 5 days a week okay so it is 85 decibels 8 to 9 hours a day for 5 days a week okay please remember it is important if i talk about the other conditions here this audiogram you can see that the patients okay one of the lines it is below 25 decibels that means the patient is having hearing loss usually okay this is actually line representing the bone conduction please remember always how to identify whether it is bone conduction or air conduction so please remember bone conduction is always above okay theek hai bc always upar rehta hai theek hai so bone conduction is always above whereas air conduction is below okay here you can see there is a ab gap if there is a ab gap it is suggest you of conductive hearing loss if there is a ab gap it is suggest you of conductive hearing loss so therefore the patient over here is having conductive hearing loss along with that a acoustic dip is again seen over here and this acoustic dip at this time it is seen at 2000 hertz which is known as the kerhart's notch which is known as the kerhart's notch and kerhart's notch is a feature of otosclerosis so please remember kerhart's notch is a feature of otosclerosis very good very good guys whereas if i compare these two audiograms over here here you can see the patient is having a rising audiogram okay here the patient is actually having a rising audiogram and can anybody tell me rising audiogram is a feature of rising audiogram is a feature of yeah gerrard's test would be negative 
Rising audiogram is a feature of. Can anybody tell me out of these four conditions? I'll make it easy for you. Whereas in this condition, you can see the patient was having high frequency hearing loss in the initial stages, and then it decreased, right? So this is actually a sloping audiogram. So can anybody tell me these two conditions are seen in? Very good. Rising audiogram is actually a feature of Meniere's disease. That is also known as endolymphatic high drops or glaucoma of ear. Right. So Meniere's disease may the a very important audiogram finding is the rising audiogram, whereas the sloping audiogram is seen in press bioacusis. And what do we mean by press bioacusis? Age induced hearing loss. Right. The age induced hearing loss or press bioacusis in this we will see a sloping audiogram that is high frequency hearing loss in the initial stages. Okay. Please remember. High frequency audiogram or high frequency hearing loss is also seen in autotoxicity. It is also seen in autotoxicity, and it is usually due to drugs. And the most common drugs responsible are aminoglycosides, that is your streptomycin-like drugs. Okay, erythromycin can also be responsible for this condition. Okay, vancomycin is also one of the antibiotics which is responsible. Then cystatin, carbapatin-like drugs are also responsible for this condition. Okay, yeah, yeah, most it is uh, aminoglycoside, canamycin, followed by streptomycin. Very good. Diuretics like loop diuretics like furosemide can also be the cause of autotoxicity. Moving further to question number nine now, a patient was diagnosed with atypoantral CSOM. I hope all of you are quite aware. Atypoantral CSOM means unsafe CSOM. We have two types of chronic suppurative otitis media: safe and unsafe. Safe one is known as tubotympanic, whereas unsafe one is known as atypoantral. Now is brought to the clinic with complaints of headache, and also his wife gives a history of seizure episode or sometimes convulsion episode. It is one and the same. The most probable clinical diagnosis in this condition. I hope it was very easy. As we know, the patient would have acute suppurative otitis media that would further complicate into either a safe or an unsafe CSM depending on the perforation. If the perforation was central, it would progress to safe CSM. If the perforation was marginal, it will progress to unsafe CSM. Maybe in this condition, the perforation was marginal and there was formation of cholesteatoma and the patient has developed anticoagulant or unsafe CSM. Now the patient presents with complication or like complications or complaints of headache and a seizure episode as well. So what is the most probable diagnosis? Let's rule it out one by one. Option A says autogenic meningitis. So please remember in cases of meningitis, guys, usually there would be the cardinal features. There would be fever, there would be headache. Headache is present, but fever history is not given. Along with that, there would be a classical feature of neck rigidity or nuchal stiffness, right? So neck stiffness or nuchal rigidity is a characteristic feature in meningitis, along with vomiting episodes can also be mentioned. So that was not mentioned. So definitely this can be ruled out. And as meninges, we know it is a covering of the brain. Meningitis rarely leads to seizure episode because seizure episode is when there is brain involvement. So if they would have termed it as meningoencephalitis, definitely I would have thought in terms of it. But as it is only meningitis, seizure episode is very unlikely. Option B says subdural empyema. If I talk about this MRI image over here, you can see accumulation of pus usually in the subdural space, right? So this is actually a subdural empyema. Again, it is in the meninges or outside the brain or brain parenchyma. Definitely seizure episode is again very unlikely in this condition as well. So this can be ruled out. Sigmoid sinus thrombosis, also termed as lateral sinus thrombosis, as we know, it is also one of the complications, intracranial complications of uh, unsafe CSM. And here the patient would present with headache for sure. But along with that, the patient would also complain of fever. And this fever would come in spikes. Okay. And this is actually known as the picket fence fever, right? This is known as the picket fence fever. Along with that, there can be involvement of the other cranial nerves also. And if I take a CT scan, I can see this delta sign. If I see a delta sign on a CT scan of brain, that is suggestive of sigmoid sinus thrombosis. It ne needs a surgical management anyway. If I So please remember the last option that we are left with, it is autogenic cerebral abscess. So in cases of brain abscess, there would be brain involvement. As you can see over here, there is a pus accumulation in a cavity like structure in the brain, mostly the temporal lobe is involved. So if they ask you which is the most common site of brain abscess due to ear infection, it is the temporal lobe because it is the closest, right? So temporal lobe is at high risk where there would be presence of brain or cerebral abscess. And when there would be brain involvement, definitely the patient can present with headache and seizure-like episode. So the answer to this question would be option D, autogenic cerebral or brain abscess, right? In, please remember in subdural empyema and in autogenic cerebral abscess, the patient would require neurosurgical management along with antibiotic cover, right? 
but in other conditions they can be managed with just conservatively or they they would require surgeries but a ent surgeon can do that but in subdural empyema and cerebral abscess as there is brain involvement the patient would require neurosurgical management for sure okay so i hope this was easy for all of you now this is a recall question so please be sure so this ct image also came in ins ct and nepj examination so be sure with it okay you can see a cavity with it uh, within it there would be blackening or a pus accumulation inside it and history of csf if i talk about middle ear infection just in short acute separative otitis media is when when the symptoms are for less than 2 weeks between 2 weeks to 3 months it is usually subacute and after 3 months the symptoms continue even for uh, more than 3 months it is chronic separative otitis media right the most common cause anybody for asom is usually acute separative otitis media the patient will have ear ache there would be fever all these features there can be ear discharge which would be there in this condition the most common cause the bacteria responsible is actually streptococcus pneumoniae also known as pneumococcus the other bacteria can be haemophilus influenzae or moraxella but please don't forget about streptococcus pneumoniae okay if i talk about the otoscopic findings in this condition you can see in the earlier stages there is dilatation of the capillaries on the tympanic membrane and these dilatation on capillaries on the tympanic membrane which give which will give a characteristic appearance this is known as the cartwheel appearance okay it is known as the cartwheel appearance so this is the cartwheel appearance which is seen on the tympanic membrane in cases of asom whereas if there is pus accumulation behind the tympanic membrane and when the tympanic membrane is actually bulging so it would appear something like this okay it would appear something like this and this bulging of tympanic membrane is due to pus accumulation behind it okay so if it was cartwheel appearance or the early stages of asom in this condition what is the treatment of choice so definitely yes it would be only medical management and mostly we prefer giving iv antibiotics to the patient right medical management but if it is a bulging tympanic membrane and it is due to pus as uh, pus accumulation then definitely along with antibiotics we also need to do a myringotomy myringotomy is opening of the tympanic membrane and with myringotomy we actually do aspiration of the pus okay we aspirate the pus okay important then it can progress to safe csom or tubo tympanic csom when there is a central perforation whereas if it is a marginal perforation it can progress to unsafe or atecoandral csom okay please remember here the perforation would be most likely central please remember the most commonly eroded <coughs> sorry the most common eroded bone would be among the ear ossicles which is the most commonly eroded bone because please remember in cases of chronic separative otitis media there is a high risk of erosion also because this infection can further lead to ischemia and that can cause necrosis as well and that would lead to bone erosion which is the most commonly eroded bone can anybody tell me the most commonly eroded bone in cases of csom is it malleus incus or stapes so please remember it is your incus bone why because malleus is connected to the tensor tympani muscle stapes is connected to the stapedius muscle okay but incus is not connected to any muscle and therefore it has the least blood supply and therefore it has a highest risk of go undergoing erosion okay please remember this if i talk about treatment of safe csom anybody safe csom would be treated with so please remember safe csom is always treated with myringoplasty okay that means repair of your tympanic membrane along with that we can also perform a type 3 tympanoplasty in this condition tympanoplasty means repair of the tympanic membrane as well as repair and inspection of the middle ear cavity also okay that is considered as type 3 tympanoplasty and if the ear ossicles are eroded sometimes we will also require a ossicular replacement prosthesis okay or ossicular replacement prosthesis is also required and here if the tympanic membrane is damaged we will use a graft and which is the graft commonly used so in cases of tympanic it is type 3 tympanoplasty when usually the ear ossicles are eroded usually the preferred one yes we can perform type 1 tympanoplasty that is nothing but myringoplasty right yes yeah yeah, yeah you will get these uh, pdf with annotations all of it don't worry about that so type 1 tympanoplasty is nothing but myringoplasty only guys okay type 3 tympanoplasty in this we will perform myringoplasty along with that also the repair of middle ear cavity along with that if required we also will perform ossicular replacement prosthesis which is the most commonly used graft as a tympanic membrane so the most commonly used graft is actually the temporalis fascia this was a recall question temporalis fascia is commonly used as a graft in place of tympanic membrane 
Okay, I hope all of you are quite aware of this. In cases of unsafe or uh, adequate enter CSOM, there would be marginal perforation. Okay, and please remember here the main cause or the main reason behind unsafe CSOM is actually the presence of cholea steatoma. Okay, it is presence of cholea steatoma. As you can see over here at the attic, attic is nothing but the upper part or the uh, upper part behind the epitympanum. That is called as the attic, right? So please remember here there is presence of cholea steatoma. And cholea steatoma will give a pearly white appearance, right? So cholea steatoma can be due to three reasons. If it is present in a child with intact tympanic membrane, a pearly white mass with intact tympanic membrane in a child, it is a case of congenital cholesteatoma. Primary acquired cholesteatoma is due to formation of retraction pockets. When retraction pockets are formed in the upper part of the tympanic membrane, that is your Shaftel's membrane or pars placida, and there, there would be accumulation of keratin and the ectopic skin, that would lead to formation of cholesteatoma. But a secondary acquired is a sequel of unsafe CSM, when there is a marginal perforation and due to which the ectopic skin of ESC grows into the middle ear cavity and that leads to the formation of cholesteatoma. So I hope all of you are quite aware of this. Okay, please remember. And the most common site of cholesteatoma, this is again a one-liner which has been asked. Most common site of cholesteatoma, very good. It is the prosax space. It is the prosax space. And prosax space is actually the space between the neck of the malleus and the pars. Placida. That means the space between the tympanic membrane and the neck of the malleus is, is known as the prosaic space, which is the most common site for your formation of cholea steatoma. Okay, please remember this. Okay, sorry. And the treatment in this condition would be MRM, that is modified radical mastoidectomy, also known as tympanomastoid exploration. Very good. Moving further now, talking about question number 10, guys. A patient was diagnosed with a benign parotid gland tumor. The most common benign parotid gland tumor is actually a pleomorphic adenoma, right? So he underwent a superficial parotidectomy. Usually as this is a benign tumor, we only perform a superficial parotidectomy in this cases. On follow-up, the patient complains of excessive sweating and redness on the cheeks after eating spicy foods. Which nerve injury can be held accountable for this condition? So this is the image you can see. There is excessive sweating over the cheeks, over the ear, in the post-auricular area or over the temporal region. Okay, and excessive sweating or the redness that can be seen over here. The provisional diagnosis in this condition would be, it is due to a nerve injury. And the provisional diagnosis in this condition, very good, it is Frey syndrome. So please remember it is the Frey syndrome, right? So it is a complication of superficial parotidectomy. So during superficial parotidectomy, when a nerve is injured in this area, so please remember that can lead to the stress syndrome. And the stress syndrome is characterized by excessive sweating over this region, cheek, temporal region, post auricular area, and redness after eating certain foods like spicy foods, which will increase your salivation, right? And it is due to a nerve known as, it is due to a nerve known as, yeah, during shaving also you can see it. So please remember it is option C, auricular temporal nerve. Okay, please remember it is your auricular temporal nerve because as we know the auricular temporal nerve it usually goes via the parotid gland so it is at a high risk of injury during a surgery of the parotid gland so please remember auricular temporal nerve can be injured and that can lead to this Frey syndrome and it is usually a self-resolving or self-limiting condition it will resolve by itself in a period of almost six months or so okay if you need to give something then you can give botulinum toxin to this patient you will give botulinum toxin to this patient Right, botulinum injection is given. So don't uh, take in literal terms, botulinum toxin. Corda tympani nerve, as we know, corda tympani nerve is responsible for taste sensation in the anterior two-third of the tongue. It is responsible for taste sensation in the anterior two-third of the tongue. And the general sensations from anterior two-third of the tongue are carried by the general sensation from anterior two-third. Important from anatomy. Please tell me the general sensations from anterior to the taste sensations are carried by corda tympani nerve, whereas the taste sensations are carried by the glossolingual nerve. Very good. So please remember it is the lingual nerve which carries the taste sensation, uh, sorry, the general sensations from the anterior two third of the tongue. Whereas from posterior one third of the tongue, posterior one third of the tongue, the general as well as the Taste sensations both are carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the ninth cranial nerve, right? It is your ninth cranial nerve. And from the posterior most aspect of your tongue, that is your vallecula, from, at the, from that position, the taste and general sensations are carried by the, which branch? Please remember it is the 
branch of the vagus nerve that is your 10th cranial nerve which carries taste as well as general sensations from the posterior most part of the tongue that is known as your valvula theek hai please remember this i hope all of these things are clear moving further talking about the next one very good question number 11 now a patient of neurofibromatosis have developed bilateral progressive profound hearing loss okay so the ent surgeon have prescribed him to get an auditory implant okay where will be the auditory implant placed in this case so i hope all of you are quite aware of this fact now so please remember i i told you if the in audiometry or in pure tone audiometry if the lines are about 25 decibels that is suggestive of a hearing loss okay that is suggestive of hearing loss if there is a ab gap that can be seen that means it is a if ab gap is seen that is suggestive of a conductive hearing loss and if both the lines are dipping down if both the lines are dipping down that is suggestive of a sensory neural hearing loss so here the patient was having bilateral profound hearing loss so please remember if i talk about uh, different types of hearing aids first okay we usually give hearing aids in patients of hearing loss so these are the different types of hearing aids the most commonly one uh, the most common one used is this one right so please remember this is the normal hearing aid okay behind the ear it is called as behind the ear hearing aid, hearing aid it is usually given in conditions of mild to moderate hearing loss okay it is given in conditions of mild to moderate hearing loss whereas if i talk about a patient okay who has a smaller pinna or microtia or anosia or there is some deformity in the pinna okay in this condition usually this type of hearing is aid is given which is known as baha bone anchored hearing aid okay that is known as baha bone anchored hearing aid which directly sends the signals to the cochlea whereas the third type of hearing aid is this one this is known as a cochlear implant okay this is known as a cochlear implant as we know cochlear implant usually is the treatment of choice in cases of profound hearing loss okay if the patient is having profound hearing loss the treatment of choice usually a bilateral profound hearing loss then the treatment of choice would be a cochlear implant surgery but what is the most important condition for this so whenever a cochlear implant surgery would be performed the most important condition for this is that the eighth nerve or the vestibular cochlear nerve should be intact okay that means there should not be any damage to the eighth nerve or your vestibular cochlear nerve because this cochlear implant will send the signals to the eighth nerve and then they would be carried forward so it is most important that the eighth nerve should be intact but as our patient over here as you can see the patient was of neurofibromatosis and as we have discussed in the previous sessions in neurofibromatosis type 2 the patient is highly at a risk of developing a cerebellar pontine angle tumor rather the most common cerebellar pontine angle tumor known as acoustic neuroma so the patient here is actually having a bilateral acoustic neuroma in this case right so which is also known as vestibular schwannoma so this acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma is actually the tumor of the eighth cranial nerve that is your vestibulo cochlear nerve right so that means the eighth nerve or the vestibular cochlear nerve in this patient having a bilateral acoustic neuroma is completely damaged right the patient was having bilateral progressive profound hearing loss it was due to the presence of bilateral acoustic neuroma and therefore the eighth nerve has been damaged so in this condition definitely cochlear implant surgery cannot be our first choice in this condition rather we will prefer a condition treatment option known as abi that is auditory brain stem implant in cases of auditory brain stem implant the electrode now is not placed in the cochlea rather it is directly placed near the brain stem okay it is directly placed near the brain stem and where exactly so here the treatment of choice would be auditory brain stem implant and it would be directly placed in the lateral recess of fourth ventricle so the electrode is placed in the lateral recess of fourth ventricle in cases of auditory brain stem implant whereas in cases of cochlear implant surgery the electrode would be placed in the scalar tympani of cochlea okay in cochlear implant it is placed in the scalar tympani of cochlea okay and behind the ear uh, hearing aid or inside the middle ear hearing aid all of these are usually done in cases of mild to moderate hearing loss and not used in cases of severe or profound hearing loss moving further talking about question number 12 again a easy question the below given instrument is used for all except so for what purpose this instrument is not used first of all tell me the name of this instrument here you have a inflating bulb and a magnifying lens which is seen so it is usually used in the external ear this is actually known very good it is known as the seagull speculum so this is known as the seagull speculum right so what are the uses of seagull speculum let's see 
Option A says magnification. Yes, for magnification of the structures of the external ear, we definitely use Siegel speculum due with the help of this lens. Option B says removal of foreign body. With the image itself, you can just say that this speculum cannot be used for the removal of foreign body. Rather, for removal of foreign body, we usually use forceps, right? Or an endoscopic removal is done. So option B is definitely not done. Uh, use of Siegel speculum in this condition. Option C says assessment of tympanic membrane movement. Yes, definitely. In a process of Siegelization, when we apply pressure in a process called a Siegelization, when we apply pressure on the tympanic membrane, we can check the mobility or the movement of the tympanic membrane, right? Whereas the next one says application of powdered antibiotic ear, antibiotic in a ear. So please remember for application of a powdered antibiotic in the ear also, we will use the Siegel speculum. As well as it is also used for checking a test known as the fistula test or the Gallais test. So for fistula or Gallais test also we use this Siegel speculum. Right? So Gallais test is usually performed in ontosclerosis, whereas fistula test is done in cases of <coughs> labyrinthine fistula, which is a complication again of CSOM. Yeah, brown sign can be seen. Right? For brown sign also. Then question number 13 now. It says a 10-year-old school boy lately is having poor scholastic performance. Okay, that uh, sometimes they can also mention of falling grades or he does not pay attention in the class, all of these features. He complains of hearing loss, which uh, for which he was brought to the clinic on audiometry, conductive hearing loss was diagnosed. The child had peculiar faces as given below, preferred management is. What is the diagnosis in this condition, anybody? The diagnosis in this condition. Very good. Definitely the child is having conductive hearing loss due to blue ear or something called as secretory or serous otitis media. Definitely. But what is the cause behind this blue ear? So please remember it is usually adenoid hypertrophy. I hope all of you are quite aware that adenoid are nothing but nasopharyngeal tonsils which are located in the posterior nasopharyngeal wall. Okay, At the posterior superior nasopharyngeal wall, these nasopharyngeal tonsils or adenoids are located. And they usually grow in size till six years of age. Then they start decreasing in size at puberty and they will completely disappear by 20 years of age. They will completely disappear by 20 years of age. So in children, there is a high risk. If the child is having recurrent upper respiratory tract infection, the child is at a higher risk of having adenoid hypertrophy. And when this adenoid would be hypertrophied, they would block the estachian tube, right? So the estachian tube opening would be blocked. And if the estachian tube orifice is blocked, that can lead to accumulation of serous fluid in the middle ear and there would be a condition known as blue ear or serous otitis media or a secretory otitis media. It is seen when there is a blockage of the estachian tube usually. Yeah, it is a recall question again. So in this condition, what should be your preferred management? First of all, what is this picture? That is important. How did I diagnose adenoid hypertrophy? Okay. Apart from that, it is common in school age going children from 4 to 10 years of age. Okay, please remember, apart from that, the adenoid thesis is very peculiar. What can be seen? The patient would have respiratory distress in this condition and therefore he is trying to open his mouth. So open mouth would be seen. A prolong of eyeballs is sometimes seen. Then there would be pinched nose which is seen. There would be a high palate. Okay, there would be a high palate and malocclusion of teeth is usually seen. So these four features are important. That is pinched nose, high palate, open mouth, and malocclusion of teeth. These are the characteristic features of adenoid hypertrophy, which is commonly seen in children, okay? And what is the treatment for this condition? So please remember, option A says adenoidectomy. Definitely we need to remove the adenoid. It is usually done by a blind surgery and a St. Clair Thompson adenoid curate is used for this procedure. So adenoidectomy is definitely going to be performed with myringotomy. Myringotomy is opening of the tympanic membrane. So the tympanic membrane is open for the reason that because that there should be a good ventilation of the middle ear. If there is ventilation of the middle ear, then there would not be any accumulation of serous fluid inside it and the chances of blue ear would be less. Right? So please remember adenoidectomy with myringotomy seems a good option. Let's see further. Option B says bone anchored hearing aid. Bone anchored hearing aid is definitely not required in this condition because it is conductive hearing loss. Bone anchored hearing aid is usually done in cases of mild to moderate sensory neural hearing losses. Right? Please remember this. Then option C says myringotomy with grommet insertion. Myringotomy is definitely going to be done. Grommet insertion is also done. This grommet is inserted, which is also called as a middle ear ventilation tube. Okay? It is actually a middle ear ventilation tube, which will maintain the ventilation of the inner ear ventilation tube. Sorry. 
ठीक है दिस इज नथिंग बट अ ग्रोमेट सो दिस ग्रोमेट इज यूजली इंसर्टेड ओके इन द एंटरो इंफीरियर क्वाड्रेंट इट इज यूजली इंसर्टेड इन दिस एंटरो इंफीरियर क्वाड्रेंट ऑफ द टिम्पैनिक मेंब्रेन but please remember here they did not mention adenoidectomy because if we do not perform adenoidectomy the patient would have recurrences okay and that is important so please remember option d should be the best answer in this condition because it says adenoidectomy with grommet insertion and if they are performing grommet insertion it is default they need to perform a myringotomy also they cannot directly insert grommet over there right so they need to perform a myringotomy also so in this condition the best answer would have been option d adenoidectomy with grommet insertion right please remember this so i hope this was easy for all of you gluvia or serous otitis media is important guys it is usually again seen in school going age children okay and uh, usually so in a please remember there is not mention about grommet if we just open the myring it will repair itself okay so please remember if i just keep the myring open that means your tympanic membrane if we, if i just make a cut it will just repair itself within a period of 2 or 3 months okay even in 3 to 6 weeks the tympanic membrane repairs itself so again the patient would have issues with air uh, ventilation in the initial stages so the best treatment should be adenoidectomy with grommet insertion okay yes one of the causes of blue ear is also nasopharyngeal carcinoma which will also obstruct the eustachian tube orifice yeah if it would have been npc in adults and not a child and the patient was having blue ear then definitely the answer preferred answer would have been myringotomy with grommet insertion only okay and definitely the removal of cancer if it was associated with it then that would have been the best choice question number 14 says now a 16 year old girl was brought to the ent department with complaints of hoarseness of voice strider that means noisy breathing dysphonia and shortness of breath at times indirect laryngoscopy was performed and the image is given below the preferred treatment option in this condition is so i hope all of you were able to diagnose usually this condition is seen in uh, seen in children between 4 to 6 years of age group okay more common is that age group but definitely it can also be seen in adolescent patients as well okay here you can see a wart like lesion so these are nothing but laryngeal warts and laryngeal warts are called as what these are called as papilloma right these are called as papilloma so this is actually a papillomatosis of larynx okay it is actually a papillomatosis of larynx it is unilateral first thing it is involving the vocal cord and it is a wart like irregular growth so definitely it is a laryngeal wart or a papilloma and it is due to which virus as we all know it is your human papilloma virus right hpv is the main cause for laryngeal warts or juvenile papillomatosis of larynx why juvenile because it commonly affects the adolescent age group or the juvenile age group right hpv which strains are common 6 and 11 no please remember 16 and 18 himanshu please remember 16 and 18 are the known causes for cancers anogenital cancer or for cervical cancer for what it is usually the milder strains like 6 and 11 where 11 is the more virulent strain for strain for causing warts okay please remember this so here the treatment option would be very easy option b co2 laser excision so co2 laser excision should have been the treatment of choice in this condition okay if i talk about the other conditions if the patient was having cyanosis or the spo2 was dropping in that condition uh, we would have thought of intubation but please remember intubation is actually avoided in this condition okay intubation is always avoided in this condition because there is a high risk that this virus could be carried down to the trachea or to the bronchi or to the lungs and there be a, there would be a high risk of cancers developing over there or warts developing over there so intubation is definitely avoided in cases of juvenile papilloma of larynx so these are the certain conditions that you need to know about larynx right if i perform a indirect laryngoscopy with something like this this is the indirect laryngoscopy mirror, mirror which has one angulation right so here you can see multiple warty regions these is known as juvenile papillomatosis of larynx here in the other one you can see this is the normal larynx or the normal epiglottis over here but in this the epiglottis has turned red okay with yellow spots on it and this is actually called as the turban epiglottis so turban epiglottis is a feature of tuberculosis of larynx the mo most earlier sign for tuberculosis of larynx is usually hyperemia of the vocal cords that is redness of the vocal cords or redness of the epiglottis but 
further it progresses to this appearance known as turban epiglottis and if the tb continues if the patient is not given any treatment then there would be this appearance of the vocal cords which is known as the mouse nibbled appearance of vocal cord so mouse nibbled appearance of vocal cord is also seen in cases of tuberculosis of larynx and as we are quite aware that in tb of larynx the treatment would be att that is anti tubercular therapy whereas the most common two conditions which has a very close differential diagnosis that has been asked why close differential diagnosis because the most common cause for both these conditions is usually vocal abuse right along with that the position for both of them is also same okay <coughs> that is junction of the anterior one third and the posterior two third okay so that is usually these two conditions which are associated with it that is vocal nodules and vocal polyp so how to differentiate please remember vocal polyp is usually unilateral and it is a polypoidal mass whereas vocal nodules are usually bilateral nodular elevation seen on the vocal cords okay and both these conditions are due to vocal abuse usually vocal nodules are also known as singer screamers or teachers nodules because of the uh, fact that it is due to vocal abuse and the best treatment of choice in vocal nodules is usually speech therapy the first line management should be speech therapy plus voice rest should be given in this condition right so it this is important whereas in cases of vocal polyp usually we will perform a micro laryngeal surgery right co2 laser excision can be performed okay co2 laser excision can be performed okay so please remember if i talk about uh, jpl guys please remember usually in juvenile papillomatosis of larynx if i talk about strider or noisy breathing please remember if strider is due to the upper surfaces like upper structures like the supraglottis it will more likely be a inspiratory strider if the epiglottis is involved if the supraglottis is involved if we go below that is below the vocal cord if subglottis is involved it is usually a biphasic strider strider which is seen whereas below the trachea it is usually a expiratory strider which is seen so there are three types of strider inspiratory due to supraglottic structures biphasic due to <clears throat> the subglottis and expiratory due to the uh, structures beneath the subglottis that is your trachea bronchi lungs all of that theek okay? hai so i hope it is quite clear now for strider question number 15 guys a patient was diagnosed with t3n1 m0 carcinoma larynx he underwent total laryngectomy along with radical neck dissection in radical neck dissection rnd all the below given structures are removed except for which structure is not removed they want to ask you so if i talk about the <clears throat> staging of carcinoma larynx it is important to remember the t staging at least where t is when one structure is involved okay please remember one only one structure is involved it is t1 t2 is when more than one structures are involved t3 is when the vocal cords will become fixed or they will become immobile okay they will become fixed or immobile very good and t4 when there would be an extra laryngeal extension when there would be an extra laryngeal extra extension of this cancer or there would be invasion of the thyroid membrane invasion of the thyroid membrane or your cricothyroid membrane whatever you can say it okay please remember this so it is the tnm staging here the patient is having t3 that means the vocal cords are fixed and immobile in this condition so t1 and t2 are usually treated with radiotherapy okay t1 and t2 are treated with radiotherapy whereas t3 and t4 are treated with surgery that is total laryngectomy is performed complete removal of larynx is done usually okay and along with that we need to do radiotherapy so it is followed by radiotherapy to prevent any recurrences and sometimes if there is a neck node metastasis as seen in this condition there was a neck node metastasis therefore in this condition we will require a radical neck dissection where we will remove the lymph nodes level 1 to 5 so the <coughs> cervical lymph nodes from level 1 to 5 would be removed along with that we will also remove the sternocleidomastoid muscle the other muscle removed is actually the omohyoid muscle the other muscle removed is the omohyoid muscle we will also remove the internal jugular vein we will also remove the internal jugular vein but please remember it is not the vagus nerve which is removed it is rather the spinal part of your 11th cranial nerve that is spinal part of your accessory nerve which has been removed in radical neck dissection it is not the vagus nerve which is removed okay please remember this so i hope i am uh, like you have understood this condition radical neck dissection level 1 to 5 lymph nodes omohyoid muscle sternocleidomastoid muscle internal jugular vein and the spinal part of your 11th cranial nerve right so uh, yeah you are answering for the next question so it is right so please remember in cases of sorry if they give you that it is a t1n0 m0 cancer in this condition usually we do not require 
a total laryngectomy or a radiotherapy here we can perform a co2 laser excision as well in this t1 n0 m0 condition we can also perform a co2 laser excision whereas if i talk about tracheostomy usually tracheostomy is performed at the level of second and third tracheal veins right it is performed at the level of second and third tracheal veins but if a patient is having laryngeal cancer and a immediate tracheostomy needs to be performed then we perform actually a high tracheostomy okay high tracheostomy is performed between the first and second tracheal vein why please remember we usually perform between second to third tracheal vein to avoid any injury to the larynx but in cases of laryngeal cancer that larynx has been completely damaged it has to be removed so in that condition high tracheostomy can be performed at the level of first and second tracheal vein okay so the only indication of high tracheostomy is cl larynx okay and these are the tracheostomy uh, tubes which are used so these are the tracheostomy tubes we we have uh, we will have a metallic tube also known as chevalier jackson tube and we also have tubes made up of pvc that is polyvinyl chloride these are the pvc tubes which are seen this one is a cuff tube and this is a uncuff tube better one would be definitely a cuff tube so cuff tube is better because it uh, prevents aspiration so the risk of aspiration decreases if we usually use a cuff tube but on long term use of this cuff tube there would be tracheomalacia that is softening of the trachea so on long term use there can be tracheomalacia one of the complication so therefore it is recommended we actually use a high volume low pressure cuff okay this cuff should be a high volume low pressure cuff dnm means please remember t for tumor which structures it invades n for the nodes which are uh, involved or metastasis is seen in which of the lymph nodes and m means distant metastasis if the metastasis is any uh, to any other organ apart from the lymph nodes if the metastasis is to any other organ that is known as m okay that is the tnm classification please remember this for every cancer we have the tnm classification theek okay? hai so please remember high volume low pressure cuff is re recommended to avoid tracheomalacia in the patients theek okay? hai so i hope uh, i have like explained you tracheostomy after removal of larynx is usually a lifelong tracheostomy and the patient could not produce sound so definitely he would require voice rehabilitation in the form of either he need to learn a speech therapy known as esophageal voice or he can use a prosthesis known as a blom singer prosthesis okay it is a tracheoesophageal puncture device blom singer prosthesis which would be placed in between trachea and esophagus whereas he can also use a handheld device okay if this is the opening of the trachea he can hold it over here and it will sense the vibrations so this actually is known as the electrical larynx okay this is known as the electrical larynx uh, recorded videos would be uploaded recorded video of this class at least would be uploaded on the afmg app okay question number 16 if i talk about a 70 year old male presented with nasal obstruction cheek swelling and blood tinged nasal discharge his ct scan has been given below likely diagnosis in this condition is so i hope it is very easy for all of you first of all it is a elderly patient elderly male right having nasal obstruction cheek swelling <coughs> and a nasal discharge so nasal obstruction uh, cheek swelling at times and nasal discharge can also be features of sinusitis okay it can also be features of sinusitis and as we know in children it is ethmoidal sinusitis which is common whereas in adults it is the maxillary sinusitis which is common but in sinusitis if i talk about this one the ct scan image please remember there would be a air fluid level that means the pus would accumulate in the lower parts of the maxillary sinus due to gravity and the upper part would show us the presence of air so this is the air fluid level which is seen usually in ct scan of the sinusitis patient so anyway sinusitis is not an option just to tell you i have told you this here you can see the mass is obstructing or occluding all of the maxillary sinus okay the whole of the maxillary sinus is obstructed by this mass let's see one by one option a says juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma as we know angiofibroma it is a vascular tumor of the nasopharynx then it is commonly seen in adolescent boys here our patient is actually a 70 year old male so definitely this can, can be ruled out and definitely please remember in cases of juvenile angiofibroma juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma there would be pushing of the maxillary sinus from behind okay and that is actually known as the antral sign of holman miller sign which is seen on a cect scan and not uh, the complete occlusion of the maxillary sinus if i talk about maxillary sinus carcinoma definitely it would have been the it, it is the best answer rather in this condition 
because please remember here we are seeing a mask which is occluding all of the maxillary sinus along with that they have given an arrow this arrow is suggestive that the mass has now started invading the orbit there is erosion of this orbital floor and now the mass has started invading the orbit yes yeah, jna is a sarkari question again so here the mass has started invading the orbit and as we know invasion or metastasis are the features only seen in cases of malignancies so it is definitely a maxillary sinus carcinoma yes the stagnant ring is also seen orbital floor fracture most of you might have confused it with it please remember orbital floor fracture may if i talk about uh, this one if this is a maxillary sinus and this is the orbit if there is fracture of the floor of the orbit which is the weakest wall of the orbit the protrusion of the eyeball contents would be something like this and this is actually known as the tear drop sign this is known as the tear drop sign okay so there would be protrusion of this eyeball contents in the maxillary sinus but it would be a tear drop sign from above below okay and not all of the maxillary sinus women would be obstructed okay and there is no history of trauma because orbital floor fracture is usually associated with trauma rhinocerebral mucor mycosis diabetic patient or immunocompromised patient okay or a post covid patient having the nasal blackish nasal mass or uh, like blackish brownish spots on the palate nothing as such a scene so definitely it can be ruled out easily yeah very good or a long term steroid therapy definitely because that leads to immunocompromised state in the patient so i hope this was pretty clear with everybody please remember important things about maxillary sinus carcinoma the most common sinus in cases of carcinoma or malignancy is actually the maxillary sinus okay two important things it is usually due to chronic or prolonged exposure to either nickel or to wood dust okay so hard uh, furniture hardwood dust to this if there is a prolonged exposure the patient can develop maxillary sinus carcinoma if there is a prolonged exposure to nickel the patient can develop a squamous cell carcinoma if there is a prolonged exposure to wood dust which is also known as wood worker carcinoma the patient will develop a adeno carcinoma in this condition yeah i would be discussing 40 questions why i hope all of you are already tired so if i talk about a clear close differential diagnosis in this condition is it is actually a polyp okay please remember it can be either a anthrocyanal polyp or it can be a ethmoidal polyp so please remember anthrocyanal polyp is usually a maxillary polyp and it's more ethmoidal polyp or a nasal polyp arises from the ethmoid bone please remember this yeah uh, then if i talk about anthrocyanal polyp please remember it is more common in adolescents and children whereas ethmoidal polyp is more common in adults okay whereas if i talk about the next things to differentiate anthrocyanal polyp is usually single but ethmoidal polyps are multiple anthrocyanal polyp is usually unilateral ethmoidal polyps are bilateral okay an important thing anthrocyanal polyp always needs a surgical management that is a fes surgery is required and what is fes functional endoscopic sinus surgery is required okay please remember in cases of chronic rhinocytis or rhinosinusitis also if the patient is not responding to only antibiotics we prefer the surgery known as functional endoscopic sinus surgery whereas in ethmoidal polyps the main stay of treatment is definitely medical where we will give antibiotics nasal decongestants to the patient if the patient does not improve then and then only the surgical option would be taken into consideration recurrence is common with anthrocyanal polyp here you can see in the above structure the polypoidal mass is actually arising from the ethmoid bone so this is actually a ethmoidal polyp okay it is a ethmoidal polyp just be sure with the ct pictures and here the polyp polypoidal mass is usually arising from the maxillary sinus so this is actually a anthrocyanal polyp this is the anthrocyanal polyp definitely the history would also be of um, uh, utmost significance when you are solving a clinical case in this condition okay the age group uh, then the site and unilateral or bilateral all of these features would definitely play a role now talking about question number 17 guys a child presented to your clinic with complaints of respiratory distress so it is a child with respiratory distress there is chin swelling and difficulty in opening mouth difficulty in opening mouth is also known as trismus or locked jaw right he gives the history of dental infection a week ago examination findings are given below what is the most probable diagnosis so sorry so guys please remember if i talk about a child having these features of respiratory distress a chin swelling this chin swelling would usually be unilateral it can either be a submental chin swelling or a submandibular chin swelling okay submental or submandibular chin swelling would be present and there is difficulty in opening mouth that means lock jaw trismus okay due to involvement of the sternocleidomastoid muscle so uh, sorry uh, due to involvement of the pterygoid muscles not the sternocleidomastoid it is due to involvement of the pterygoid muscles right so he gives history of dental infection also 
so all of these features which are associated with history of dental infection or dental caries a week ago definitely it can be a infection of the floor of the mouth okay it can be a infection of the floor of the mouth also called as the submandibular space and this floor of mouth is made up by the mylohyoid muscle so it is actually infection of the mylohyoid muscle or the floor of mouth or uh, to be specific it is the submandibular space okay here you can see there is infection there is abscess formation all over here and there is a unilateral neck swelling the patient can have respiratory distress as well so this is a characteristic finding of option c ludwig's angina so this is actually a ludwig's angina please remember brachial cyst if i talk about <coughs> brachial cyst mein there would not be any abnormality in the mouth okay the patient would not uh, suffer from respiratory distress in the initial initial stages and the patient would present to you either in childhood if it is more appreciable or most likely like around uh, her teenage like around 11 to 12 years of age book, okay at that time the patient presents to you and again in brachial cyst also there is a unilateral neck swelling as you can see over here in this condition but please remember it is a anterolateral neck swelling if it is a anterolateral neck swelling along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle it is usually a brachial cyst and it is not associated with history of any infection because in brachial cyst there is accumulation of serous fluid it is not a infective fluid or pus or abscess which is accumulated within it and brachial cyst the most common cause please remember it is due to persistence or presence of the second third fourth and the sixth brachial cleft okay most commonly it is the second brachial cleft or the second pharyngeal pouch which persists and that there if there is accumulation of serous fluid that would lead to formation of this brachial cyst anterolateral neck swelling if there is a posterolateral neck swelling usually in a child and if i uh, throw a torch light at this it would be transilluminant positive so transillumination positive posterolateral neck swelling this condition is due to a lymphatic abnormality and this is known as cystic hygroma okay and one more question that i have not included it is sarkari and a very common question from ent a patient a child having a throat infection or recurrent respiratory upper respiratory tract infection presents with a pseudo membrane or a membrane in the oral cavity and this membrane would extend up to the palate okay if this membrane is extending up to the soft palate it is more likely to be diphtheria the most common cause of whitish membrane is actually acute streptococcal tonsillitis okay if i talk about whitish membrane guys please remember if i talk about whitish membrane the most common cause is acute streptococcal tonsillitis but here or in cases of vincent sanjayna okay here the whitish membrane does not extend up to the palate but in cases of diphtheria the membrane would extend up to the palate first thing and second on scraping the membrane there would be bleeding or spots which would be seen so that is the characteristic feature of diphtheria and diphtheria can also be characterized by bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy so there would be a diffuse neck swelling known as bull's neck in diphtheria right so i hope uh, you are quite sure about diphtheria yeah so diphtheria is very common please remember from micro also you need to be thorough with it so if i talk about the differential diagnosis really fast so please remember if it would have been an infection of the retropharyngeal space it would have lead to infection of the lymph nodes of rovio okay it would lead to infection of the lymph nodes of rovio which are present in the retropharyngeal space and if these lymph nodes are infected there can be pus formation and that would lead to retropharyngeal abscess it is a pediatric airway emergency because it uh, the child would be very toxic with high grade fever there would be respiratory distress drooling of saliva uh, strider which would be present so all of these features don't you think they are also similar in cases of acute epiglottitis so please remember retropharyngeal abscess is a close differential diagnosis of acute epiglottitis so if i take a lateral x ray of neck i would not see a thumb sign unlike uh, acute epiglottitis rather i would see accumulation of pus or widening of the prevertebral shadow so here the prevertebral shadow actually would be widened due to accumulation of pus at that point at that point okay please remember this if i talk about a similar condition here also the same symptoms would be there but it is a prevertebral abscess why please remember with widening of prevertebral space due to accumulation of pus there is also erosion of the cervical vertebral bodies if the cervical vertebrae have also been damaged that means there is erosion of these vertebrae definitely it is not only limited to the retropharyngeal space it is rather extending up to the prevertebral space also and this is actually a prevertebral abscess and the most common cause is actually tuberculosis of cervical spine in this condition whereas the two other differential diagnosis here one is quincy which is also known as peritonsillar abscess right in quincy or peritonsillar abscess we know there is accumulation of pus in between the tonsil and its bed okay and it will push the ovula or the soft palate to the other side so pushing of ovula to the other side would be seen along with that there would be trismus 
that is locked jaw there would also be fever and all that symptoms apart from that there would be muffling voice known as hot potato voice and fluency but please remember swelling would not be seen a uh, no cell swelling would be seen in cases of quinzy if all the features of quinzy are there in the patient but a uh, external swelling is also observed then it is not quinzy rather a parapharyngeal abscess in quinzy external swelling is not appreciated please remember if there is an external swelling with quinzy features it is usually a parapharyngeal abscess okay theek hai so i discuss about quinzy further we have a question question number 18 a patient presents to the emergency with epistaxis that is nose bleed there was no relief on pinching the nostrils okay so the physician thought to locate the bleeding artery after visualization of the bleeding artery what is the next best step in management so please answer as we know epistaxis or nose bleed if i talk about the most common cause of epistaxis usually it is more common in children and the most common cause is usually nose picking or nail trauma right nose picking or nail trauma is the most common cause of epistaxis it is usually seen in children whereas if i talk about elderly patient in them there would be the most common cause in this condition would be hypertension in children usually this area is more commonly affected the nose picking is seen at the antero inferior part of the nasal septum so this is actually known as the littles area right and this littles area as we know it contains a plexus of arteries known as the kiesel bach plexus right kiesel bach plexus hota hai so definitely it gets injured and that that can be the cause of epistaxis whereas in elderly usually there would be a posterior epistaxis commonly which is seen and that is due to damage or rupture of the woodruff's plexus so take it it is due to the damage or rupture of the woodruff's plexus so important kiesel bach plexus i hope all of you are quite sure it is made up of four arteries and these are the most common artery which bleeds is also known as the artery of epistaxis it is the spino palatine artery right the other one is the greater palatine artery both of these are the branches of your maxillary artery which in turn is a branch of the uh, external carotid artery the next one is your superior labial artery and the last one is your anterior ethmoidal artery so please remember posterior ethmoidal is not a part of the kiesel bach plexus rather it is a part of the woods ruff plexus posteriorly so it can be a cause of posterior epistaxis not anterior So here the child was having uh, epistaxis. As we know, the first line management in epistaxis is usually applying direct pressure, that is pinching the nostrils, right? So if even up on applying direct pressure, the patient does not have any relief, then we try to actually locate the bleeding artery. And after we visualize the uh, bleeding artery, we will perform a chemical cauterization. And chemical cauterization is performed either with a silver nitrate solution, or it can be performed with and all that is carbolic acid so please remember this okay chemical cauterization is usually the second best step after direct pressure which is done okay but for that we need to visualize the bleeding artery if the bleeding artery was not visualized properly we cannot perform the chemical cauterization if the chemical cauterization fails we can even perform electrical cauterization and please remember the third step so i'll write one by one first is direct pressure second is chemical cauterization third is electrical cauterization which can be performed with a bipolar cautery not an unipolar cautery always please remember it is the bipolar cautery which is used very good the fourth step if even on electrical cauterization if the bleeding does not stop then definitely we will go for packing the fourth step would be packing either we can perform a anterior nasal packing or both anterior as well as posterior nasal packing as it is seen in this condition right so anterior and here we can see a posterior nasal packing so please remember this nasal packings can be performed uh, with a roller gauze or a tape gauze which is covered with soframycin and antibiotics okay it is covered with antibiotics to prevent any infection and this nasal pack is usually kept for at least 7 24 to 72 hours after 72 hours we remove the pack and check if the bleeding is still going on okay so please remember anterior or posterior nasal pack can be inserted depending on the site of bleed okay for posterior nasal pack previously we used to use the tampons nowadays we have usually these balloon catheters which are used okay apart from that we can also use a uh, normal foley's catheter for this purpose okay please remember this so this is important yeah the four step would be uh, anterior or posterior nasal packing with gauze or balloon catheterization and if it fail then the fifth procedure would be ligation of the arteries now we will start surgery ligation of arteries and the first to be ligated is the most common artery rupture that is spino palatine artery so here we will perform a trans endoscopic spino palatine artery ligation if this also perform, if this also fails then the sixth would be the tie a ligated parent artery and spino palatine artery ki parent artery kaun si thi so maxillary artery ligation would be performed 
If still bleeding occurs, then definitely the parent artery of maxillary artery would be ligated, and that is your external carotid artery. And now next would be your internal carotid artery, right? So the next would be the next one. Very good. Please remember, it is not the internal carotid artery because internal carotid artery takes blood supply to the brain. If you ligate it by mistake, also Ram Nam Satya hai. Please remember this. So the next step would be if on uh, ligating all these arteries also, if the epistaxis is not uh, controlled, definitely the cause can be a posterior epistaxis or posterior rupture of Woodruff's plexus, and there you perform an anterior or posterior ethmoidal artery ligation. Okay, that is the last step. We do not perform internal carotid artery ligation. How to recognize whether it is external carotid or internal carotid? So please remember, external carotid artery usually gives away eight branches in the neck. So the artery which has eight branches in the neck is external carotid, and internal carotid does not give away a single branch also in the neck. Okay. So I hope you are quite sure of this epistaxis procedure now, and you won't make any mistakes. Okay. Depending on the history they have given, you need to choose the management. Question number nineteen now. They say a patient was undergoing total thyroidectomy. He started experiencing difficulty in breathing and repeated attempts to extubate the patient were unsuccessful. So we are trying to remove the endotracheal tube, but the attempts have been failed following the procedure. What could be the cause of this? So I hope all of you are quite aware. When a patient is uh, like a patient is undergoing total thyroidectomy, if I talk about the thyroid gland in close relation to this thyroid gland, superiorly. We have the superior laryngeal nerve, and inferiorly we have the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Both of these are branches of the tenth cranial nerve, that is your vagus nerve, right? As we know, both of these superior uh, as well as the recurrent laryngeal nerve, both of them innervate the larynx. Okay, they have sensory as well as motor innervation of the larynx. But please remember, during total thyroidectomy, during the surgery of thyroid, the more uh, at a risk would be your recurrent laryngeal nerve. Okay, so please remember the RLN, recurrent laryngeal nerve, is at the highest risk of getting injured during a total thyroidectomy surgery. Rather, if I can put it like this, that the most common cause of bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, most common cause of bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy in India usually, it is still iatrogenic. That means injury during total thyroidectomy. So total thyroidectomy surgery is the still most common cause of bilateral RLN palsy in India. Okay, so definitely this patient would be at a high risk of bilateral RLN palsy. And I hope all of you are quite aware. If I talk about the muscles of larynx first, the only abductor of larynx is usually your posterior cricoarytenoid muscle, whereas the adductors of larynx are four. It is your thyroarytenoid muscle, interarytenoid muscle, lateral cricoarytenoid muscle, and the last one is cricothyroid muscle. And the tensors which give quality of voice to the uh, quality of voice, these are usually the main tensor is the cricothyroid muscle, and the other one is also known as the vocalis muscle, which is nothing but a part of lateral cricoarytenoid itself. Okay, so all of these muscles, as we know, all of these muscles are innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve, except for the cricothyroid muscle, which is innervated by the external branch of the. superior laryngeal nerve it is innervated by external branch of superior laryngeal nerve so if there is rln palsy what would happen the vocal cords will come to lie in which position they will come to lie in median position okay so please remember they would be in closed position therefore the patient can produce sound properly okay there would not be any orphonia or dysphonia sound would be normally produced but the patient would definitely have difficulty in breathing respiratory distress as the vocal cords are closed and therefore the extubation is difficult in this patient so it is actually a bilateral abductor palsy because the abductor has been totally lost whereas at least we have one abductor working and that is cricothyroid so cricothyroid will bring the vocal cord in median position as it is a abductor so it should be option b bilateral rln palsy or bilateral abductor palsy in this condition which is the cause of repeated attempts to a failed extubation or respiratory distress if it would have been rln plus sln palsy guys please remember if it would have been rln plus sln palsy that would lead to a bilateral adductor palsy because all of the muscles would be paralyzed so there would be a bilateral adductor palsy and the vocal cord will lie in the paramedian position or the cadaveric position just like in dead bodies okay and as here the vocal cord is open the patient would not have any respiratory distress but the patient could not produce sound so the features would be orphonia along with that there would be a high risk of aspiration in this case which can further progress to pneumonia in this patient right so in bilateral adductor palsy there is complete palsy of rln plus sln unilateral rln palsy the more common right sided or left sided rln palsy is seen unilaterally 
more commonly left or right other than pulses seen this was a question please remember yes abductor is the life saving muscle if it is not working due to rl and palsy then the vocal cords will close and the patient will have respiratory distress so please remember the left sided recurrent laryngeal nerve is at a more risk of uh, injury because as we know left recurrent laryngeal nerve has a longer course okay and as it has a longer course because it is in close relations with the left bronchus the left atria the left lung okay therefore it is a higher risk of undergoing injury or compression because of pathologies of any of the Uh, organs that are in close relation to it. Okay, please remember this. SLN palsy. If it is there, then there would be cricothyroid muscle paralysis, and that would only lead to a poor quality of voice. That will only cause a poor quality of voice in the patient. They will uh, explain you a singer is having poor quality of voice. All of these features can be explained at times. Ortner syndrome can lead to unilateral RLN palsy. And what is Ortner syndrome? Please remember, due to left atrium megaly. Okay, enlargement of the left atria. the left recurrent laryngeal nerve would be compressed that can cause a unilateral left sided rln palsy due to left atrium megaly and that is known as ortner syndrome theek hai so i hope i have covered the palsies vocal cord palsies now this is important please remember question number 20 now recall question again easy a child was brought to the emergency of your hospital with history of ingesting a coin so definitely the child has ingested a foreign body and the most common foreign body ingested is usually a coin in children in adults it is usually a impacted food material like fish bone in adults it is the dentures important question from surgery one liners okay so here the child has ingested a coin x ray taken is given below this is the x ray comment on the site of impaction so if i talk about the x rays <coughs> in uh, okay and the site of impact impaction if i take a antero posterior x ray okay if i take a ap view of the x ray and a lateral view of the x ray okay this is the ap view this is the lateral view If on a lateral view the coin coin appears slit like, if on lateral view the coin appears slit like, <coughs> and on AP view the coin appears circular, then usually the coin has been impacted in this fashion. Okay, the coin has been impacted in this fashion because the uh, lateral diameter of the esophagus is more as compared to the antero posterior diameter. Okay, and therefore the coin lies in this fashion. Where antero posterior it would be circular, laterally it would be a slit like. In this condition, you can see it is a slit like structure. So definitely it is in the esophagus. The second thing that you can see there is also presence of a air shadow or air space. And if there is presence of this air space, that is suggestive of trachea. As we know, esophagus is behind, whereas trachea is in the front, right? So there would be a air space. that is suggestive of trachea and behind the trachea or behind the air space there is impaction of this foreign body uh, which is usually in the esophagus so lateral x ray slit like appearance ap uh, ap view circular appearance definitely the coin is in the esophagus whereas vice versa on lateral x ray circular appearance okay in lateral x ray circular appearance and in ap x ray slit like appearance <coughs> the coin would be usually in the trachea so in this it is the site of impaction is option b that is your esophagus so i hope this was easy again question number 21 a 50 year old male gave the history of tinnitus that is a ringing sensation in the ears and there is hearing loss in the right ear that means the patient is having unilateral tinnitus and unilateral hearing loss from the past 7 years now recently he had started having some loss of balance and persistent headache his audiometry showed moderate sensory neural hearing loss in the right ear what is his diagnosis so if there are any any cases of conductive hearing loss we can rule it out easily so let's see if the options are of conductive hearing loss because the patient is having moderate snhl vestibular schwannoma snhl glomerulus jugular snhl sometimes it can also lead to conductive hearing loss so it is a less likely diagnosis in this condition menial disease snhl sigmoid sinus thrombosis chl or snhl can be seen in this okay so let's see if i talk about this condition usually glomus jugular as we know it is more common in females elderly females around 50 to 60 years of age group but here our patient is a male apart from that in glomus jugular if i talk they will more likely talk about a red bleeding mass right they will talk about a red bleeding mass right and uh, sometimes they will also talk about a rising sun sign on otoscopy okay all of these features will be discussed or on sigilization there is a brown sign all of these features are seen but definitely it is not glomus jugulis then the patient is having tinnitus and hearing loss tinnitus and hearing loss are seen in vestibular schwannoma also and meniere's disease also both of these conditions can have unilateral tinnitus and hearing loss 
but in menial disease usually the tinnitus or hearing loss which is seen is usually fluctuating okay in glomus jugular we usually have a pulsatile tinnitus okay it is a vascular tumor so pulsatile tinnitus is a feature of glomus jugular but a fluctuating tinnitus is a feature of menial disease right sigmoid sinus thrombosis can be easily ruled out because there is no history of csm as such there is no history of fever in this patient also the spiky or the picket sun fever so this can be ruled out so please remember here fluctuating tinnitus was not seen in the patient and important thing about menias is here the patient presents with fluctuating tinnitus and fluctuating hearing loss but usually these some symptoms they subside within 24 hours but here the patient is saying that the symptoms are progressive for the last 7 years now okay now he has also started having uh, like loss of balance that is ataxia and persistent headache so if there is headache or there is loss of balance definitely there would be involvement of cerebellum or other structures in the brain so it is due to option a vestibular schwannoma or acoustic neuroma which is the most common cerebellar pantoin angle tumor it is the tumor of your eighth cranial nerve that is your vestibular cochlear nerve that causes hearing loss okay on long term it can lead to a profound hearing loss also and there can be tinnitus also and uh, usually in the later run there can be loss of balance and persistent headache in the patient as well so this uh, is actually a characteristic case of vestibular schwannoma in vestibular schwannoma usually we have a roll over roll over phenomena that you need to remember at least remember the name roll over phenomena is seen in cases of vestibular schwannoma if i talk about the ct pictures here you can see the first ct scan is showing what there is erosion of the keratico jugular crest so actually this is a bony septum okay so this bony septum between the car uh, internal carotid artery and your jugular vein has been eroded okay so erosion of this keratico jugular crest or a bony crest is usually known as with sign so this is known as your felt sign okay this is known as your felt sign which is seen in cases of <clears throat> sorry please remember so please remember this is the felt sign which is seen in cases of vestibular schwannoma or acoustic neuroma this is the felt sign due to <coughs> degeneration of this keratico jugular sorry it is seen in cases of glomus jugular sorry it is seen in cases of glomus jugular it is the felt uh, felt sign where there is erosion of the keratico jugular crest whereas this is the what is this this is the rising sun sign right this is the rising sun sign please remember this is the rising sun sign when there is protrusion of this red bleeding mass into the middle ear cavity the floor of the middle ear is usually eroded due to the jugular bulb tumor and it enters the middle ear cavity and behind the tympanic membrane it appears like a red mass this is actually known as a rising sun sign because it looks like a rising sun okay please remember on otoscopy and if you perform segalization in acoustic uh, in glomus jugular usually we will found pallor pallor of this red mass would be seen and this is known as the brown sign Okay, that is known as the brown sign. Very good, Aquinas sign. Yes, and this is the cerebellar pontine angle tumor, which is known as acoustic neuroma. Right? This is the MRI brain. Question number twenty-two. Now, a fifty-six-year-old female presents to the OPD with sudden onset pain around the jaw, drooling of saliva, and drooping on one side. The patient gives history of painful vesicles in the external ear, and there is a mild hearing loss. What is the next step in management? First of all, what is the provisional diagnosis? Please tell me. It was very easy. I hope so. A elderly patient, female, presenting with sudden onset uh, pain around the jaw, drooling of saliva, drooping on one side. Definitely, all of these features are of facial palsy, right? There is palsy of your seventh cranial nerve. That is your facial nerve. So all of these features are of facial palsy. Whenever there would be facial palsy, please remember there would be flattening of the forehead on affected side. That means loss of wrinkles on the affected side. there would be wide opening of the eyelids and actually the eyelids are not able to close properly because the orbicularis oculi muscle is not working due to the facial palsy and this condition important from ophtha this has been asked as a image based question this is known as lag of thalamus when the eyelid is not able to close properly okay and as the eye remains constantly open there is a high risk of exposure keratitis or corneal ulcer in this patient right for that we usually give um, like hydrating ear uh, eye drops to this patient apart from that there would be flattening of the nasolabial fold or we can say flattening of the nasolabial fold on the affected side is seen whereas if i talk about drooping of mouth please remember drooping of the corner of mouth is seen on the affected side whereas elevation of the angle of mouth is seen on the normal side so anything can be mentioned in the question okay that is important to be remembered if i talk about facial palsy guys 
Please remember the most common cause of facial palsy is usually most common cause of facial palsy is Bell's palsy, right? And the most common cause of Bell's palsy is usually idiopathic, unknown cause, right? But there are some hypotheses, and one of the hypotheses is usually a hyper uh, herpes simplex virus infection is one of the common causes of Bell's palsy in a patient, right? So that has been implicated. But in this condition, it is definitely not a herpes. Uh, it is not due to a trauma. Usually trauma is also one of the common causes of facial nerve palsy. It is not a trauma. It is not a herpes simplex virus infection. Rather, in herpes simplex virus infection, there would have been presence of herpes levialis. That is, these vesicles would have been present around the lips or the mouth. Here, the uh, <clears throat> please remember, and herpes simplex virus is usually common in young adult patient, like in the reproductive age group. Right. Whereas if I talk about elderly patients here, it is a 56 year old female having all these external vesicles that you can see in the external auditory canal, these fluid filled vesicles in the external auditory canal, which is also associated with pain of the ear or of the temporal region. Okay. This is more likely to be a condition known as Ramsey Hunt syndrome, which is also known as herpes zoster. Orticus. So please remember this is due to a virus known as herpes zoster or varicella zoster. That is your chicken pox virus. It is due to reactivation of this chicken pox or herpes zoster virus. Okay. So this is herpes zoster orticus, also called as the Ramsey Hunt syndrome. Very good. So in this condition, what should be the next step in management? As we know, it is a viral infection which has caused the edema of the facial nerve. Therefore, there is compression and that has led to the facial palsy in this patient. So please remember, let's start. Start topical antibiotics. Anyways, antibiotics are out of questions. They are not given in any facial palsy because we think viral infections are more commonly a cause, not bacterial infections. So this can be ruled out. <coughs> topical steroid for three weeks. Usually, please remember in cases of facial nerve palsy, we give oral steroids to the patient for a period of three weeks and not topical steroids are given. So this can be ruled out. Surgical decompression of nerve. Surgical decompression of nerve is the last resort. If the patient does not respond to the medical therapy, then definitely we can think in terms of surgical decompression of nerve. Okay, so here it is actually option A. We need to start the drug of choice for herpes simplex or herpes zoster infections, and that is ercyclovir. So oral ercyclovir is started 800 mg five times a day for five days usually. Okay, whereas oral corticosteroids are usually given for a period of three weeks. Okay, that will decrease the edema of the facial nerve. In cases of trauma, please remember if it is an immediate onset facial nerve palsy then definitely surgery would be the uh, surgery would be preferred if it is immediate onset that means due to trauma the facial nerve has been damaged okay but if it is a delayed onset facial nerve palsy that means it is usually due to edema and if it is a delayed onset then definitely steroids are the mainstay of treatment in this condition right please remember otherwise oral or cyclovir is the first line management in cases of facial nerve palsy apart from trauma okay so i hope i have made myself clear i need to remember this Question number 23 says, a patient with ear wax underwent syringing. So as all of us are quite aware, oral toilet or ear cleaning is usually done with the help of syringing when the external ear is impacted with ear wax, excess of ear wax, which is made up of the cerumen uh, that is secreted from the ceruminous glands, which are nothing but modified apocrine sweat glands in the external ear. Okay, so this ear wax impacted is removed with the help of syringing. And during syringing, the patient developed syncopal episode, which nerve is responsible for this. So sometimes what can happen, uh, usually it is recommended that we use the water at 37 degrees Celsius. That means a warm, warm water should be used for syringing. But if the intern or anybody for that matter uses cold water for syringing, what can happen? Definitely there would be irritation of the nerve. Okay. And that can lead to either a cuff reflex or a syncopal episode in the patient. Okay. So please remember, if I talk about the tympanic membrane, so the antero superior quadrant is usually innervated by the branch of the fifth cranial nerve, that is your trigeminal nerve, and this is your auriculotemporal nerve. So auriculotemporal nerve innervates the antero superior part, whereas antero inferior part is usually innervated by a branch of your tenth cranial nerve, that is your vagus nerve, and this branch is known as your Arnold's nerve or Aldermans nerve. This is known as your Arnold's nerve or Aldermans nerve, right? And whenever this part would be <clears throat> uh, irritated okay so the whenever the arnold's or the aldermans nerve would be irritated, uh, uh, irritated that would lead to two things first of all a cuff reflex would be stimulated in the patient and second a vasovagal syncope can be seen in the patient a vasovagal syncope so the patient can have a syncopal episode the patient can turn unconscious and it is due to the reason because this arnold's or aldermans nerve which is the auricular branch of vagus nerve 
it is responsible for this particular condition. Okay, please remember posterior inferior is innervated by the C3 branch of cervical plexus and the posterior superior part is innervated by the <coughs> auricular branch of your facial nerve. An auricular branch of your facial nerve, it is usually the sensory division. It is known as which nerve? Nerve of. So this nerve has a characteristic name. The sensory division or sensory branch of your facial nerve has a characteristic name known as nerve of Wiersberg. Okay, this usually innervates the posterior superior aspect of the external auditory canal as well as the posterior superior quadrant of your tympanic membrane and whenever please remember this nerve or this branch would be injured there would be loss of sensation in the posterior superior posterior superior wall of ESE and this is actually known as which sign so please remember this is known as your Hitzel burger sign this is known as your Hitzel burger sign please remember this okay no issues with this uh, cold water can definitely also cause vertigo in the patient. Okay, cold water can definitely lead to vertigo also. In sometimes uh, nystagmus can also be seen in the patient. Okay, so and please remember the direction for syringing. Please remember the direction preferred for syringing is usually the posterior superior direction. Okay, it is the posterior superior direction which is preferred. Antero inferior <laughs> agar hota hai or cold water if used, then definitely irritation of this nerve can lead to cuff reflex or vasovagal syncope. Definitely, please remember they can also ask you about the innervations of the pinna. That is important. Majorly the pinna along with the lobule, the lateral aspect of pinna is innervated by your greater auricular nerve. The conca or the simba conca is innervated by your facial nerve and the vagus nerve branches. And the medial aspect of pinna is innervated by your auricular temporal nerve, which is branch of your mandibular nerve. And mandibular nerve is the third branch of your trigeminal nerve. Right? So no, no, no. For child and adults, it is usually the same only. Warm water is used and it is in the posterior superior direction itself. Okay? Some part or posterior, it is also innervated by the lesser occipital nerve of the pinna. Question number 24, guys. Now, a patient of chronic separative otitis media presented with positive Rhinus test. This was a very confusing question, so we attended. Positive Rhinus test and positive fistula sign. The patient refused treatment and came back after two months. Now, the fistula sign is usually negative. What is expected finding on a tuning fork test? So if I talk about the tuning fork test, guys. So usually if I perform a tuning fork test, I will use a 512 hertz uh, tuning fork and I will check for Rene's test, Weber's test and absolute bone conduction, right? So please remember, we say if the air conduction is more than bone conduction, that means the Rene is positive, which is seen in normal patient and also seen in cases of mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss. Whereas bone conduction if more than uh, air conduction this means the rene is negative which is a feature of conductive hearing loss okay whereas if i talk about webers when the vibrating tuning fork would be placed at the vertex or middle of the forehead if the sound can be heard in the midline then definitely it is a normal patient but if the weber is lateralized to one of the ears definitely the patient is having a hearing loss okay so if the sound is heard better in the bad or the affected ear then it is a conductive hearing loss and if the sound is heard better in the good or the normal ear, it is actually a sensory neural hearing loss. Okay, so please remember this. If important is how you actually diagnose it. If the Weber goes away from the affected ear, it is sensory neural hearing loss. If the Weber comes towards the affected ear, affected ear it is conductive hearing loss. And Weber is the first test performed, then we usually go to the Rennes test. Absolute bone conduction, here we will check the bone conduction of the patient and it would be compared with that of the examiners or the doctors, okay? If both of them are equal, it is suggestive of a normal patient usually or a conductive hearing loss. And if the absolute bone conduction of the patient is decreased, that means the patient is having SNHL sensory neural hearing loss. So here, okay, let's see. Apart from that, you also need to remember about fistula test because they have mentioned in the question. So how do we perform a fistula test? Please remember on applying repeated pressure on the tragus, okay, opening and closing of tragus or uh, by doing segalization with the segal speculum will apply pressure in the external auditory canal with both these things, what can happen? Please remember this pressure would directly be transmitted to the inner ear or the labyrinth. If there is presence of abnormal connection known as fistula, this pressure from the external ear would directly be transmitted to the inner ear or the labyrinth, okay? And if this pressure is directly transmitted to the inner ear, the patient can have vertigo and the patient can also have nystagmus in this condition. So this is considered as the positive fistula test. If or changing the pressure, due to change in the pressure, if the person is having vertigo and nystagmus, it is considered as positive fistula test. And as we know, positive fistula test, true positive fistula test is usually seen in cases of labyrinthine fistula, which is a complication of CSOM, right? Labyrinthine fistula. 
whereas the false positive fistula test is usually seen in children in cases of congenital syphilis okay false positive it is seen in cases of congenital syphilis all right please remember this <coughs> right whereas a negative fistula test please remember negative or a false negative fistula test if i would say in better terms a false negative that means fistula is present still the test is negative this is a false negative fistula test okay so false negative fistula test can be due to either of the two reasons first if the inner ear is dead if the inner ear is dead though the pressure is transmitted directly to the inner ear it would not sense it okay so the patient could not have vertigo and nystagmus so first there would be a dead labyrinth and the second condition can be the fistula is usually covered with a cholecystoma fistula is covered with cholecystoma so the pressure could not be transmitted to the inner ear right in both these conditions we will have a false negative fistula test okay yeah it is suggestive of unilateral severe sensory neural hearing loss very good so in this patient please remember the patient had a positive fistula test so we will consider it to be true positive and like it had been a labyrinthine fistula in the patient and as a complication of the csom the patient refused treatment as the patient refused treatment what have what would have happened this infection from the middle ear now has progressed to the inner ear also and that has led to a dead labyrinth or a dead inner ear now okay and therefore now when the patient comes back to us the fistula sign has turned negative so fistula sign from positive now it has turned to negative so it is now false negative because of the dead inner ear as the inner ear is infected now right so please remember this condition is usually in this patient there would be a unilateral severe sensory neural hearing loss right this patient would have a unilateral severe sensory neural hearing loss the patient is having positive renes so as we have discussed positive renes is usually seen in cases of sensory neural hearing loss so definitely we are suspecting snhl but here it is usually unilateral severe sensory neural hearing loss due to the dead inner ear and in cases of dead inner ear as we know please remember the nega would be false negative in this patient okay please remember the rene would turn false negative so previously it was positive now it would turn false negative in this patient okay please remember this so the answer to this question is option b question number 25 now a lady delivered at 33 weeks of gestation the neonate was cyanosed when examined that is blue in color the neonate was observed to turn pink while he was crying so <coughs> please remember as soon as the child was given birth he was blue due to cyanosis but when he starts crying usually the child turns pink okay so what is the next step in management of this child so the provisional diagnosis in this condition is usually so please remember the posterior nasal openings known as cavana okay this posterior nasal openings or cavana they are not formed in this child here there is a unilateral cavanal atresia whereas in the other picture b here we can see a bilateral cavanal atresia that means the posterior nasal openings have not been formed it is usually seen in premature infants right so please remember bilateral cavanal atresia is being seen and therefore the nasal cavity is not connected to the nasopharynx right so the child could not breathe and as we know neonates this was a question in uh, june 2021 neonates are actually obligatory nasal breathers okay they can only and only breathe via nose these uh, neonates are usually obligatory nasal breathers they could not breathe via mouth okay so in this condition as the child could not breathe via nose as there is bilateral cavanal atresia therefore the child is having hypoxemia that is causing cyanosis and the child is turning blue but when the child is opening the mouth okay when the child is opening the mouth there is passage of some oxygen and definitely on that the child will turn pink the cyanosis would decrease somewhat okay so this is the classical case of bilateral cavanal atresia in this condition and what should be the next management option a says oxygen by nasal prongs anyways the nasal cavities posteriorly are not open so nasal prongs are of no use in this condition ct scan would be done but it would be done later it is not the next best step in the management right so it would be done for diagnosis but it would be done later surgical repair with stent it is usually done but again it is done after confirm confirmation from a ct scan right so please remember here the best treatment would be option b actually using a goodell airway which is also known as the oropharyngeal airway okay it is a oropharyngeal airway which is used the images here you can see varying sizes of goodell airway in different colors so it is actually a goodell or oropharyngeal airway which would be placed in the mouth if this is not available a nipple would be placed but that would be placed to keep the mouth open and some amount of air will go via the mouth and the patient would not have cyanosis right so i hope this is easy for you next moving further to question number 26 now a 26 year old female 
presents with complaints of long standing mucopurulent discharge from the right eye with swelling near the medial canthus as seen in the image the doctor have suggested dacryocystorhinostomy the nasolacrimal duct will be opened into so please remember this condition is over uh, overlap from ophtha also young patient having long standing mucopurulent discharge from right eye okay along with that there is swelling at the medial canthus this is the site for your lacrimal sac so definitely the patient is having inflammation of your lacrimal sac known as dacryocystitis and as we know the treatment of choice for dacryocystitis is surgery known as dacryocystorhinostomy as we know the, uh, from the lacrimal sac the tears are drained by the nasolacrimal duct and this nasolacrimal duct opens into the inferior meatus normally okay and it goes downwards it goes laterally and it goes inwards right and it opens into the inferior meatus but what happens usually in when it opens into the inferior meatus there is a very small orifice which is there and this orifice can get stenosed or blocked okay and that, if this orifice is blocked there would be accumulation in the lacrimal sac and that can lead to infection that is dacryocystitis in this patient right so now whenever we will perform dacryocystorhinostomy in this patient we will open this nasolacrimal duct into a more wider meatus and this wider meatus is option c middle meatus right this middle meatus is also the site of drainage for maxillary sinus anterior ethmoidal sinus and your frontal sinus sorry uh, okay anterior ethmoidal sinus maxillary sinus and your frontal sinus sphenoid sinus please remember it <coughs> sorry it usually opens into the <coughs> supreme meatus right as we know sorry <clears throat> moving further and this the instrument that has been shown over here it is the instrument used for dacryocystorhinostomy it was given in the december 2021 session this is called as the dcr punch also known as the kerrison punch okay so this is the dcr punch that, uh, what you can see over here question number 27 now a 35 year old male presents to the ent opd with fluctuating tinnitus nausea vertigo and has started developing hearing loss lately he states Yes, and NAD nasal lacrimal duct opens into inferior meatus, but during surgery they have asked you, okay? So the doctor has suggested dacryocystorhinostomy. The nasal lacrimal duct will be opened into. So during surgery it would be opened into the middle meatus. Okay? Huh. So now the patient is a young adult male having fluctuating tinnitus, nausea, vertigo, and hearing loss. He states that the symptoms subside within few hours, and he does not like noisy areas. what is this phenomenon known as first of all tell me the provisional diagnosis i hope it is very easy as we have discussed pulsatile tinnitus glomus jubilate okay progressive tinnitus and progressive hearing loss vestibular schwannoma very good fluctuating tinnitus and fluctuating hear hearing loss it is seen in meniere's disease which is also known as endolymphatic high drop or glaucoma of ear due to increase in the endolymphatic pressure right so that would lead to a fluctuating tinnitus nausea vertigo in this patient sometimes vomiting and there would be a fluctuating hearing loss but all these symptoms would some subside within a period of 24 hours so this would be a episodic disease but then the hearing loss would progress and the patient can have hearing loss in between the episodes also in the later stages and the patient does not like noisy areas and they have asked you what is this phenomenon known as in meniere's disease the patient does not like or the, uh, the patient hates going to noisy areas because what happens usually the loud sound appears more loud to this patient the loud sound appears more loud to this patient and this is actually known as your recruitment phenomena option d it is the recruitment phenomena of meniere's disease tullio's phenomena please remember guys tullio's phenomena is when the patient during episode can have vertigo during episode the patient if has vertigo it is actually known as the tullio's phenomena rollover phenomena as i already discussed you rollover phenomena is seen in cases of vestibular schwannoma or acoustic neuroma please remember uh, where the loud uh, okay so please remember rollover phenomena or acoustic uh, is a feature of acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma whereas paracusis villi villi when please remember the patient hears better while going to noisy areas so it can be a, a what we can say indirectly proportional statement for recruitment so the patient will hear better when going to noisy areas this phenomenon is known as paracusis villi which is a feature of auto sclerosis i hope all of you are well known with this paracusis villi is a feature of auto sclerosis so i hope this was easy one easy one question number 2 and please remember in meniere's disease the drug of choice usually during the episode we can give anti vertigo drugs like prolprolpromazine uh, to the patient 
or acetazolamide is usually given to decrease the endolymphatic pressure in this patient and acetazolamide and if the patient is not responding to any medical therapy then definitely we will prefer performing a endolymphatic sac surgery and this endolymphatic sac decompression surgery for this the landmark which is used is actually known as the donaldson sling so it is the donaldson sling for mastectomy it is your mac evans triangle for endolymphatic sac surgery it is your donaldson sling please remember question number 28 now a patient was having earache that is pain in the ear fullness in the ear with fever so more likely it is an infection and he was definitely diagnosed with aswm that is acute suppurative otitis media within few days he started developing ear discharge retroorbital pain and double double vision on history taking he stated he was not taking medicine so he was not compliant the likely diagnosis is so i hope it is very easy for you a complication of asom where there are three most important features right first being your ear discharge right second one is your retroorbital pain right and the third one this retroorbital pain is due to involvement of which cranial nerve it is due to involvement of your fifth cranial nerve that is your trigeminal nerve and the last feature is your double vision that means diplopia and this diplopia is usually seen on lateral gaze okay and this diplopia on lateral gaze is due to lateral rectus palsy and this lateral rectus muscle is innervated by which nerve it is innervated by your sixth cranial nerve that is your abducens nerve so due to sixth cranial nerve involvement lateral lateral rectus palsy would be there which causes diplopia so it is actually also known as the d disease because please remember there would be discharge there would be a deep seated retroorbital pain and there would be a diplopia so it is option c gradinogo syndrome the triad is of gradinogo syndrome which is seen in cases of petrocytes when there is infection of the petrous apex air cells of the mastoid right so mastoidal petrous apex air cells when they are infected they would lead to this gradinogo syndrome triad sigmoid sinus thrombosis which i told you already there would be other features like spiky fever and not involvement of the retroorbital uh, like not involvement of the fifth and sixth cranial nerve rather in sigmoid sinus thrombosis there would be involvement of the seventh cranial nerve more commonly right vanderhoof syndrome please remember it is a triad of autosclerosis it is a triad of autosclerosis in a patient osteogenesis imperfecta and blue sclera okay these are the three things and whereas melkerson rosenthal syndrome can be remembered by a mnemonic rap okay this is also a triad where r goes for recurrent facial nerve palsy r goes for recurrent facial nerve palsy a goes for swelling of lips that is called as angioedema and p i have made it that is persistent fissuring of tongue so actually there is persistent fissuring of tongue so you can remember it like this okay so please remember these are the three features of melkerson rosenthal syndrome you yes investigation of choice would be a mri on that we can see pus accumulation in these petrous apex air cells and surgical management is required for petrocytes usually right <sighs> moving further question number 29 a 19 year old male that is a young adult or adolescent male presents with high pitch voice so usually males have a low pitch voice as we know right masculine voice is low pitch but the patient is having high pitch voice that is a feminine voice and due to this feminine voice his friends are making fun of him which among the following will be the next step in the management of this condition so i hope all of you are quite aware of this condition the provisional diagnosis in this condition where a male, adult male is having a feminine or high pitch voice this is known as puberphonia right this is known as puberphonia and which is the next step i have not asked you the best step i have asked you about the next step so very good it is the option c speech therapy known as gutsman's maneuver when the patient will press the thyroid cartilage and will practice vocal exercises this is known as the gutsman's maneuver so we remember you uh, it usually like uh, man have some guts okay so that is how you remember puberphonia here we perform gutsman's maneuver which is a speech therapy and if the patient does not respond to gutsman maneuver for a period of 6 months then we definitely move on to a surgery known as type 3 thyroplasty right thyroplasties can be remembered by a mnemonic mls type 1 thyroplasty mein medialization of vocal cord in bilateral adductor palsy then <coughs> sorry medialization of vocal cord in bilateral adductor palsy then type 2 sorry yeah type type 2 thyroplasty here <coughs> we will do lateralization of the vocal cord okay and type 3 mein we will do shortening of the vocal cord so shortening and loosening of the vocal cords is done in cases of puberphonia that is type 3 thyroplasty is performed whereas type 4 thyroplasty is performed in a similar condition where we will have a low pitch voice or a masculine voice in females known as androphonia right a for oral 
and P for Purush. So that is how I remember it. The type four thyroplasty is usually seen in uh, performed in cases of androponia. Teflon injection in vocal cords is usually done in cases of unilateral vocal cord palsy. It is done in cases of unilateral vocal cord palsy. Okay. Please remember this. Sorry. Moving further, guys. Now, in type four thyroplasty, please remember. So, in type three, shortening was done. In type four, lengthening of the vocal cords and tightening of the vocal cords were done. Okay. No issues with this. Question number thirty. Now, it is easy again. Two-year-old child brought to your OPD with complaints of respiratory distress, noisy breathing. That means strider. They have not mentioned about which type of strider it is. Brassy cough, sometimes also referred to as the barking cough, and now it becomes easier. The mother gives history of low-grade fever. X-ray taken has been given below. This is the AP view of chest and neck X-ray. All the below given treatment options can be employed except for. So first of all, let's come to a provisional diagnosis. It is a condition when usually children between three months to three years would be involved. It is the most common cause for this condition is actually the para influenza virus. It is due to a viral infection, right? And the most common site to be affected is usually the subglottis. As we can see on the X-ray. Here there is a narrowing of subglottis, and it looks like the apex of the church, and this is known as your steeple sign. So this is uh, this steeple sign is due to narrowing of the subglottis in this patient, right? Because it is the most commonly affected part, and if subglottis is involved, the patient can usually have a biphasic strider, right? Which is seen in cases of this condition known as crowd. Very good. It is crowd. That is nothing but acute laryngotracheobronchitis. It is acute laryngotracheo. Bronchitis. Please remember where there would be barking cough in the patient, stri biphasic strider, respiratory distress, low grade fever would be there. Okay, and a steeple sign on AP view of the X-ray. So what shall be done? So let's see. Option D says give supplemental oxygen and Helios. Definitely for bronchodilation and for the respiratory support, we need to give oxygen and Helios. Helios and Helios supplementation have shown brilliant results in patients of crowd. Okay, please remember this. we need to start antibiotics so please remember yes though it is a viral infection due to para influenza virus uh, hpv can be implicated in some condition but it is very rare okay so please remember option c start antibiotics definitely though it is a viral infection we start antibiotics in this patient to prevent any secondary bacterial infection to prevent any secondary bacterial infection usually in this patient we usually start antibiotics also in this patient option b says give nebulized epinephrine definitely epinephrine or adrenaline would be given in this child in the nebulized form because that will help in bronchodilation and that will relieve the respiratory distress in this child option a says reassurance to the parents no it is a pediatric airway emergency please remember and whenever children are uh, affected with infections we do not take it lightly rather we admit this patient and start all these uh, procedures along with that sometimes antivirals can be given but they are not uh, like the mainstay of treatment also we start steroids in this patient right steroids are also started a similar yeah yeah i am explaining you a similar kind of condition is usually acute epiglottitis again which is also pediatric airway emergency guys but how to differentiate between both these conditions first of all the age group in crow it was 3 months to 3 years whereas in acute epiglottitis it is 2 to 7 years more commonly they will mention about the school going age child first thing second thing here the cause was para influenza virus here in acute epiglottitis it is a bacterial infection and the more common cause please remember it is your streptococcus pneumonia okay followed by hiv that is hemophilus influenza type b so streptococcus pneumonia is the most common cause followed by hiv right now talking about the symptoms in uh, crow or acute ltb as we saw the symptoms were minimal like respiratory distress noise stride by physics strider barking cough or a low grade fever was there on the other hand in cases of acute epiglottitis the child would appear toxic the infection would be very severe okay the child would present to you in emergency there would be a high grade fever in this child first thing second thing there would not be presence of any barky or brassy cough in this child apart from that noisy breathing that is strider would be seen but this would mostly be a inspiratory strider in this patient because epiglottis or the supraglottis is commonly affected in epiglottitis unlike ltb or crow where subglottis was commonly affected right so as here epiglottis is affected so it is a inspiratory strider which is seen <coughs> along with that definitely respiratory distress is more severe in patients of 
acute epiglottitis. Like it is more severe, and this patient can have a falling SpO2. The patients can have uh, hypoxemia also, and there would be continuous drooling of saliva from the mouth of the patient. Why? Because please remember, swallowing anything would be so difficult and painful for this child that there would be a continuous drooling of saliva from the mouth of this child. Apart from that, the child would actually bend in a forward position and sit like this. Okay, this is actually known as the tripod position. It is the position of comfort for the child. So the child would be sitting in a tripod position. So if all of these features are present, definitely it is a uh, acute epiglottitis. And if I take a lateral X-ray neck of so okay, I, lateral X-ray soft tissue neck, if it is taken, I can see a swollen epiglottis, and this is actually known as the thumb sign. Right? It is a thumb sign. Please remember, X-ray would not be the my first choice in this management of this patient. In acute epiglottitis, as I told you, it is a pediatric airway emergency. If there is laryngeal edema and that progresses further, intubation would be really difficult in this child. So the first step in management of acute epiglottitis patient is usually a early intubation. Okay, or urgent intubation is indicated in patients of acute epiglottitis as the first choice. Whereas in crowd patient. Intubation can be done if required, if the SPO2 is falling, but it is not the first choice in these patients. Okay? So I hope I have made the differences clear and uh, definitely in acute epiglottitis, steroids are to be started in this patient also. We will require intubation, definitely oxygen and heliox are to be given. Epinephrine can also be given into this patient because bronchodilation and antibiotics, that is IV third generation and uh, cephalosporins are usually started again. Okay? I hope I have made, made it clear. Question number 31 now. A patient presented to your clinic with unilateral hearing loss and pain over the cheek. Pain over the cheek or the temporoparietal plane, they would usually say. This is again due to the involvement of your fifth cranial nerve, that is your trigeminal nerve, right? A diagnosis of nasopharyngeal carcinoma was made, which among the following is the most common clinical presentation of this disease. So they have directly given you the diagnosis of NPC nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is more common in uh, adult patients around 40 to 50 years of age group. It is more common in males of the Chinese race usually, right? It is the carcinoma or malignancy of the nasopharynx, okay, which arises from which side? It arises from the fossa of Rosenmuller and it also can cause blockage of the external uh, estrogen tube opening and that can lead to uh, blue ear or serous or secretory auditis media in this patient, right? And the treatment, please remember, it is usually chemo radiation in this patient. It is chemo radiation which is preferred. Okay. Over surgery in this patient. Very good. It is, please remember, it is not a unilateral hearing loss, which is the most common presenting symptom. Unilateral hearing loss or unilateral conductive hearing loss, to be very much precise, it would only be seen in cases where there is blockage of the estation tube and where the patient has progressed to blue ear. If there is no gluia, the patient would not complain of a unilateral conductive hearing loss. So it is actually a later manifestation. Along with that, pain over cheek or temporoparietal pain is due to fifth cranial nerve involvement, which is again a later manifestation and not the earliest one. The earliest one or the most common one the patient will present with is option B, that is cervical lymphadenopathy. Enlargement of your cervical lymph nodes due to metastasis. So it is a metastatic cervical lymphadenopathy with which the present of nasopharyngeal carcinoma usually presents to you. Okay. And the triad of nasopharyngeal carcinoma on which questions have been asked in December 2021, it is the Trotter's triad and it can be remembered with the mnemonic NPC itself or you I have given UPT also previously where N goes for neuralgia that is trigeminal neuralgia due to fifth cranial nerve involvement. P goes for palatal palsy and palatal palsy is due to which nerve involvement? 10th cranial nerve involvement, that is vagus nerve, and C goes for unilateral conductive hearing loss in the patient, right? So this is the trotter stride of NPC. If I talk about these two similar conditions, here there would be a young adolescent boy, okay? A young adolescent boy presenting with a nasopharyngeal mass, definitely, and a cheek swelling, which could be there. So it is a juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. It is a vascular tumor, mostly arising from the spinopalatine foramen, and Due to the mass, the child would have cheek, uh, cheek swelling. Along with that, there would be uprolling of the eyeballs and protrusion of the eyeballs would also be seen. That is known as proptosis. So all of these features together is known as the frog face deformity, right? It is a feature of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. And as I told you, the investigation of choice in juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, it cannot be a biopsy as it is a vascular tumor. In glomus jugulare also, it cannot be a biopsy because in... Uh, Vascular tumors, biopsy is contraindicated as there can be profuse epistaxis of bleeding in this patient. Okay, and that can, the patient can bleed to death. 
okay therefore biopsy is contraindicated and rather we perform a contrast in our ct scan which will show us that the maxillary uh, posterior maxillary sinus wall has been pushed forward this is known as the holman miller sign or the antral sign in this patient right please remember this nasopharyngeal carcinoma as we already uh, spoke about it it is arises from the fossa of rosenmuller at the posterior superior wall of the nasopharynx okay and trotter stride is usually seen there would be a cervical metastatic cervical lymphadenopathy which is the most common clinical presentation right question number 32 now a 23 year old girl smita presents with complaints of headache nasal blockage and a constant nasal dripping what will be the best investigation for diagnosis so these all are features the provisional diagnosis in this condition when the patient is a younger patient or it can also be seen in uh, elderly patient or in children also there is uh, there are symptoms of headache there is nasal blockage and a constant nasal dripping sometimes they can also tell you about a post nasal dripping these are all features of sinusitis as i have told you in children it is ethmoidal sinusitis in adults it is usually the <coughs> in adults it is usually the maxillary sinusitis which is common as you can see please remember the best investigation for sinusitis option a says x ray paranasal sinuses water view as we know water view as you can see over here so this is the water view which is also known as the occipital mental view which is taken from a 45 degree angle right and it is for all of the sinuses it is the best view overall for all the paranasal sinuses except for the sphenoid sinus and the posterior ethmoidal but sphenoid sinus can be seen if the mouth is open but posterior ethmoidal cannot be seen on a occipital mental view or a water view so this can be a initial investigation of choice that is a first line investigation in cases of sinusitis we can also perform a x-ray pns caldwell view caldwell view usually better for looking at the frontal sinus or the maxillary sinus mainly sometimes we can also look at the anterior ethmoidal air cells or anterior ethmoidal sinus in this so it is also taken at a angle but this is actually a occipital frontal view right so again it is an x ray and as i have told you always x ray or radiological investigations are not the investigate uh, are not the definitive investigation so if we have any better choice than that then we need to actually find that also so x ray would definitely be the first choice okay but not the best investigation out of all these would be the first choice but not the best investigation okay uh, and if it was an adult definitely i would have preferred a caldwell view because uh, like i would have been able to see the maxillary sinus properly right ct scan pns can be performed it is the best radiological investigation okay but again radiological investigations as i told you it is not the definitive investigation or the best investigation so it is option c diagnostic nasal endoscopy which is the best investigation overall it is the diagnostic nasal endoscopy where you can see the uh, meatuses okay you can go along the passes from the inferior meatus via the medial meatus okay and you can check for the drainage of the sinuses if the drainage of the sinus is blocked that is definitely an indication or if there is pus draining from the sinus that is definitely an indication that the person is suffering from uh, of sinusitis okay rhino sinusitis so here you can see that i have discussed already a air fluid level in the maxillary sinus ct scan this is suggestive of a sinusitis so this is a air fluid level and if i talk about this nasal endoscopy picture which has been asked earlier also so it is important to uh, remember this and the laryngo indirect laryngoscopy picture please remember always they can ask you these pictures and can mark at any structure and ask you which is this structure so the posterior most structure that we can have over here the fossa that can be seen it is actually a fossa of rosenmuller whereas the anterior most opening that we can see it is usually the eustachian tube opening and it is sub separated by the torus tubular uh, torus tuberis or the tonsillar pillars right please remember so it is the nasopharynx surface anatomy that you can see via a <coughs> endoscopy in this picture theek okay? hai no issues with this and sinusitis is usually treated with antibiotics on a long term if the patient does not respond to antibiotics or nasal decongestant then definitely we can perform a surgery known as fest functional endoscopic sinus surgery next <coughs> sorry next question number 33 a patient of press by acuses as we discussed already press by acuses means age induced hearing loss right it is age induced hearing loss the patient has been found to have high frequency sensory neural hearing loss on audiometry on pure tone audiometry we can see a high frequency sensory neural hearing loss in the early stages as we know there is a sloping audiogram which is noted in cases of age induced hearing loss or press by acuses right which of the following part of the inner ear is affected in this patient 
so let's you need to take a screenshot i'll send you the file don't worry about that so here please remember as i told you in the earlier stages the patient would have a high frequency hearing loss and that is why a sloping audiogram can be seen in cases of presbycusis and as we know the uh, for high frequencies usually the responsible part of the cochlea as we know cochlea is responsible for hearing okay cochlea is responsible for hearing so please remember the apex of cochlea usually cochlea is a structure having 2.75 turns right it has a bony part and a membranous part so please remember here the apex of the cochlea is responsible for a low frequency hearing okay it is responsible for low frequencies whereas the basal turn of cochlea is responsible for high frequency hearing so if there is any high frequency hearing loss definitely there have been a damage to the option b basal turn of cochlea right there would be an uh, damage to the basal turn of cochlea as we know vestibule is made up of two structures utricular and saccule and uh, utricular and saccule both are responsible for linear balance in a patient both of them are responsible for linear acceleration or linear balance in the patient whereas semicircular canals that is posterior superior and lateral semicircular canals they are responsible for angular they are responsible for angular balance or angular acceleration of the patient this has been asked what are the functions of these semicircular canals okay i hope all of you are able to answer this question number 34 now a young boy was involved in a fight and sustained a nasal fracture so the most common cause of nasal bone fracture is usually uh, trauma again and nasal bone as we know it is the most common bone to undergo fracture you decided to perform immediate close reduction which among the following instrument would be used so here they would have mentioned basically about the nasal bone fracture but nevertheless uh, like there are high chances of nasal bone fracture as compared to the nasal septum fracture so it is the nasal bone which is com commonly fractured and for nasal bone fracture before the edema starts okay even before the edema starts we need to perform a immediate close reduction and that is done with option b these are known as the walsham forceps so with the help of these walsham forceps we perform a immediate knee, uh, close reduction of the fracture of fractured nasal bones theek okay? <clears> hai <throat> no 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 option c is not a dcr punch please remember option c uh, is actually a anterior rhinoscope okay this is a anterior rhinoscope which is used for inspection of the nasal cavity anteriorly okay whereas the other one is also used for inspection of nasal cavity but uh, it is not a self retaining device it is known as a thudicum's nasal speculum this is known as a thudicum's nasal speculum theek okay? hai please remember whereas the uh, a image that you have these are actually the angulated ones these are actually known as the ash forceps and as we all are quite aware that the ash forceps are used for reduction of the nasal septum fracture these are used for reduction of the nasal septum fracture it can either be a jarjave fracture horizontal one or a chevalet fracture or vertical one right so nasal fracture septum sorry fracture of nasal septum would be reduced with the help of ash forceps theek okay? hai i hope all of you are quite aware of these instruments now question 35 what is the significance of the given line in the image so this given line is easy to just uh, come to a conclusion it extends from the medial canthus of the eye to the angle of the mandible this is known as the ongrens line and as we know ongrens line is usually drawn in cases of maxillary sinus carcinoma right in cases of maxillary sinus carcinoma if the cancer or the malignancy extends beyond this line if it involves the area above this line definitely there would be early orbital involvement and the patient would have a poorer prognosis okay the patient would have a poorer prognosis so it is actually used for option c prognostic evaluation of carcinoma of maxillary sinus okay so please remember for total maxillectomy which is the treatment of choice for maxillary carcinoma where this here in the below image we are performing a total maxillectomy and here you can see the line has been drawn okay along the maxillary sinus for resection of the maxillary bone and this is actually known as the weber ferguson approach so for total maxillectomy we have a approach known as the weber ferguson approach where it would be drawn like this and it was also image which came earlier please remember weber ferguson important inverted papillom of nose also known as the ringerts tumor which grows into the lateral wall of the nose Question number thirty-six says a twenty-five-year-old woman presents with progressive bilateral conductive hearing loss, which improves in noisy areas. Right? On examination, the tympanic membrane is normal, and the audiogram shows bilateral conductive deafness. Which among the following statement is incorrect regarding the diagnosis? So please remember always a young adult female having a progressive 
bilateral conductive hearing loss my first differential diagnosis would always be otosclerosis theek hai and otosclerosis also known as otospongiosis it is usually aggravated during pregnancy sometimes that can also be mentioned in the question right the hearing loss increases during pregnancy and they have given that the hearing loss usually improves in noisy areas and this phenomena we studied earlier this phenomena is actually known as paraacusis villesi right so this is diagnostic of otosclerosis let's see further on examination tympanic membrane is normal so please remember some of you have a doubt that this appearance is usually seen so please remember this appearance in cases of otosclerosis is only seen in active cases only in 10% of the cases it is seen and this is actually a pinkish hue on the tympanic membrane known as the flamingo pink appearance also known as with sign so flamingo pink appearance also known as the schwart sign so if the patient is schwart sign positive or flamingo pink appearance is present that means it is a active case of a disease where the drug of choice would usually be sodium fluoride for that patient okay sodium fluoride would be given right 90% times the tympanic membrane would be normal in this patient and audiogram is showing bilateral conductive deafness which among the following statement is incorrect so the provisional diagnosis in this condition is definitely otosclerosis so let's rule it out one by one option a says impedance audiometry shows type as curve so impedance audiometry looks for two things first of all the tympanometry which will show us different types of graphs and second for the stapedial reflex stapedial reflex is mediated by your stapedius muscle and it will prevent the ear from loud noises right so that is what is stapedial reflex so impedance audiometry shows a type as graph or tympanometry with loss of stapedial reflex so both of these features are seen in cases of otosclerosis option b says gentamicin is used in cases of active cases as i told you sodium fluoride is used in cases of active cases of otosclerosis and it is not gentamicin rather gentamicin is used in cases of meniere's disease it is used in cases of meniere's disease as the approach after acetazolamide and then we progress to surgery okay stapedotomy with titanium prosthesis is the preferred treatment yes if they ask you the treatment of choice for otosclerosis overall they do not mention about active case if they mention about flamingo pink appearance or active case definitely it is going to be sodium fluoride but if they just mention about uh, otosclerosis then your answer should be stapedotomy that means opening of the stapes which has been sclerosed of fibros all around and along with that we need to <coughs> replace the stapes with a titanium or a teflon prosthesis so this is actually a stapes piston prosthesis so this is a stapes piston prosthesis okay this will go into the stapes foot plate and this would uh, go around the <coughs> long process of the incus okay please remember this so this is the stapes titanium prosthesis along with stapedotomy is the best treatment option stapedectomy is now it is not preferred definitely option d says the most common site of origin for otosclerosis is fistula ante fenestra yes this is the place just uh, like in front of the oval window known as fistula ante fenestra which is the most common site of origin for otosclerosis so this statement also stands true this is also true so please remember option b is the false statement gentamicin is not used in the active cases rather it is sodium fluoride which is used in active cases if i talk about tympanometry graphs because they are important here you can see the type a graph that we have seen over here it is the normal graph it is seen in normal patient if it is lesser than the type a it is actually a type as curve and this type as curve is usually seen in cases of auto sclerosis whereas if the graph is above the normal curve this is the type ad curve when the ossicular ossicles are moving freely and this is usually seen in cases of ossicular dislocation this is seen in cases of ossicular dislocation whereas type b here you can see it is a flat curve and this flat or type b curve it is usually seen in two conditions either first in cases of glue ear also known as serous otitis media and second when there is perforation of the tympanic membrane perforation of tympanic membrane and this type c curve is seen in cases of eustachian tube blockage right so i have made myself clear this is important please remember you need to revise the tympanometry question number 37 a 16 year old boy again a young adolescent boy presents to you with complaints of nasal obstruction and frequent nose bleeds that frequent nose bleeds means epistaxis ct scan show the anterior sign definitely the diagnosis is easy you suspect a tumor so 16 year old boy with nasal obstruction and recurrent epistaxis the diagnosis is none other than juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma which is a vascular tumor of the nasopharynx ct scan cct is the investigation of choice which further confirms our diagnosis with the help of the anterior or the holman miller sign which is seen definitely we are suspecting a tumor that is jna which what is the most common site of origin 
Fossa of Rosenmuller is the most common site of origin for mesopharyngeal carcinoma. Option B, Spinophyllite and Foramen is the most common site of origin for the juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Pyriform sinus is the most common site of origin for the carcinoma hypopharynx. Okay, carcinoma hypopharynx. Please remember this. Then, question number 38. The lateral x-ray of an elderly man shows calcification of the laryngeal cartilages. Which of the following is unlikely to be involved? So I hope this was the easiest one. As we talk about the laryngeal cartilages, there are total six laryngeal cartilages. This was a question which has been asked, so important. Okay, there are total six laryngeal cartilages, three paired ones and three unpaired ones. Right? Please remember. The three paired ones are known as arytenoid cartilage, which makes up the posterior one third of the vocal cords. Then corniculate cartilage and cuneiform cartilage, which are rudimentary. They do not have any functional value. Whereas unpaired cartilages, the largest one is the thyroid cartilage, which is made up of two lamina and that makes up an angle. 90 degree angle in males, so Adam's apple is seen. Obtuse 120 degree angle in females, so it is not evident. Cricoid or a ring-like cartilage. And then it is the epiglottis, which is the leaf-like cartilage. All the cartilages are made up of hyaline cartilage, which will definitely ossify with age for uh, after 25 years of age. Except for one that is E for elastic. That is epiglottic cartilage is actually an elastic cartilage. It is made up of yellow elastic cartilage and it will do not, uh, it will not ossify with age on the long term. Please remember, only laryngeal cartilage does not ossify with age is elastic cartilage. Okay? Moving further, question number 39. Energy, yeah, tum se aati hai. Tum baithe ho na apta? So that is why I'm continuing also. Question number 39 says, an 18 year old patient presents with dysphagia that is difficulty swallowing fever and trismus. Trismus means locked jaw. On examination, one-sided tonsil is enlarged, right? Congested and it is pushing the soft palate of the uvula to the other side. All of the following statement about this condition are true except. So we need to actually find the false statement. But let's come to a provisional diagnosis in this condition first. Young patient usually having dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, fever, trismus, sometimes hot potato or muffling voice Okay, and on oropharyngeal examination, the swollen or the congested uh, tonsil is pushing, <coughs> sorry, the ovula or the soft palate to the other side, right? So this is actually a picture of quincy, that is peritonsillar abscess, right? So abscess is located between superior constrictor and tonsillar capsule. Yes, so please remember, as we know in peritonsillar abscess or in quincy, the pus or the abscess is located in between the tonsil and its bed. And its bed is formed by the superior constrictor muscle. So it is between the tonsillar capsule and the superior constrictor muscle. This is a true statement. Option B says, trismus is seen due to spasm of the lateral pterygoid muscle. Let's see. Trismus is seen, but are the lateral pterygoid muscles the cause for it? Option C says, single episode of quincy is an absolute indication for tonsillectomy in children. Yes, please remember, children may, if there is a uh, like uh, episode of quincy usually, that is an absolute indication that a tonsillectomy would be performed. Not during the episode. During the episode, we will actually perform a peroral incision and drainage for the child. Okay, we will actually aspirate the pus, peroral incision and drainage, along with antibiotics would be given. And after a period of six weeks, we will perform tonsillectomy. And as I told you, this actually is called as the interval tonsillectomy. But interval tonsillectomy would be performed. So a single episode is also an absolute indication. Option B says interval tonsillectomy is done after six weeks. Definitely is a true treatment. So please remember option B, that is trismus is not due to the spasm of lateral pterygoid, rather it is due to the spasm of the medial pterygoid muscle. Please remember this. Okay? So this is the false statement about Quincy. And the last question for today, a young child operated for adenotonsillectomy, that is adenoid removal, uh, like adenoid removal was done, adenoidectomy also they would have said, Developed atlanto axial subluxation. At last means the first one, axis means the second cervical vertebra. So there is a subluxation between the first and second cervical vertebra known as atlanto axial subluxation. What is the possible diagnosis in this condition? So, as we know, during adenoidectomy surgery or during tonsillectomy surgery, a high hyperextension of neck is recommended for the position. And this is actually called as a rose position. Due to this rose position, there is a higher risk of C1, C2 or atlanto axial subluxation. This is called as nothing but option B, Grissel syndrome. Okay, Kalman syndrome is characterized by anosmia, that is loss of sense of smell along with hypogonadism. And this hypogonadism is the cause of infertility in this patient, right? 
whereas Ortner syndrome we discussed left atrium eagerly causing compression of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. So left RLN unilateral palsy will be seen. And eagle syndrome when there is excessive growth of the styloid process of the mastoid. Okay, excessive growth of the styloid process of the mastoid. Okay, that will cause compression of the ninth cranial nerve. That is your glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay, and that can cause pain around the jaw. So this actually is known as the syndrome called as styalgia. This syndrome is known as styalgia. Okay, please remember. And it is also called as eagle syndrome. Styalgia is also known as the eagle syndrome. It is due to the excess growth of the styloid process. And the compression is of the ninth cranial nerve. That is your glossopharyngeal. So thank you so much. I hope all of you have understood.